Right, um, well, we know uh, councillors and staff. Um, it's going to I do our usual um, opening in terms of reminding people that the public section of this meeting is being recorded and it will be made available on our website following the meeting, uh, archived for a period of three years. To any members uh, of the public who are here today in the gallery, all care will be taken to maintain your privacy. Sound, please. However, <laughs> as a visitor in the public gallery, your presence may be recorded and by remaining in the public gallery, it's understood your consent is given if your image is inadvertently broadcast. Remind us all present that local government decision making affords no protection to councillors, council officers and the public for comments made during the meetings that are subsequently challenged in court of law and determined to be slanderous. So with that, I'll uh, welcome Kerry uh, Gillespie from the Bay of Plenty Times uh, to the meeting. And I would ask if Councillor White uh, would be good enough to lead us in an acknowledgement and tribute uh, to the passing uh, of Dr. Kahi Natai. <laughs> ご遠慮と言いまたが、ベタボーティングのレクトアクロリーとなっておりますが、ご遠慮の方、ご遠慮の方、ご遠慮の方、ご遠慮の方、ご遠慮の方、ご遠慮の方、ご遠慮の方、
Hi, councillors. I just want to uh, thank staff uh, for all of the work that's gone on to today's um, agenda. I also want to acknowledge all the work that uh, Amanda uh, has done with staff to try and ensure that we have um, <coughs> appropriate time to discuss some very important matters, but we also keep our mind uh, on the fact that we will need to be leaving this meeting at 1pm today. So I want to acknowledge you, Amanda, for all the work and for the work you've done with staff in that regard, so thank you. Um, apologies, we have one apology from Councillor McDonald, I'll so move, second to Councillor Rose, and those in favour, I, I beg your pardon. We also have an apology from Councillor Etty, so I'll so move, second to Councillor Rose, all those in favour, aye against and carried. There is no public forum, there are no items uh, that are not on the agenda, you will have uh, in front of you um, an updated copy of the Climate uh, Action Plan. Does Kitty have a copy of that? Um, thank you. <coughs> uh, order of business, there are to be no changes. Declarations of conflicts of interest, are there any? Councillor Thurston. Madam Chair, Committee, Māori, item 8.62.1. Um, I have a son who's Senior Policy Advisor to the Ministry of Art, Culture and Heritage and would have been involved in this policy and legislation. Thank you. We'll acknowledge the conflicts of interest so declared by Councillor Thurston and Councillor White. Um, any public business uh, to be transferred uh, that is in the excluded section of the meeting to be transferred to the open? There is none. So we'll now move to the minutes uh, of this committee meeting of the 4th of May. I'll so move they are a true and correct record. A seconder, I have Councillor Nees. Matters arising. There are no matters arising. I'll put the minutes as a true and correct record. All those in favour. I'll second it by Councillor Nees. All those in favour, aye, against and carried. We're now going to move to item uh, 8.1. And uh, it's a great delight to welcome um, Professor Battersall, Chris, to uh, present to us today. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to come to talk with us today about the recently held uh, Marine uh, Conference. So thanks very much. Um, and I know you've got a lot to get through. Um, and we thank you for, for you know, um, trying to condense the way, but thanks very much. How did you go? Yeah. Uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katara, e te whanea a tāuna moana. Tēnā koutou, ko Chris Addishal to go onwa, no mongi i stahu. Uh, I'd also like to take a moment to uh, acknowledge um, uh, Dr. Ki, uh, Kihi um, Natai. Um, he welcomed me when I first arrived here, here I say 10 years ago. Um, with some sage wisdom, and um, I've seen him frequently ever since, so it's, uh, it's a very sad day. Um, and hopefully um, the content of this presentation uh, would please him, um, because I know he was very strongly interested in Makalanga, um, and uh, how we might be able to feed that to sites. So um, thank you for the invitation to uh, give you a very quick, probably as brief as I can, uh, rundown of the uh, New Zealand Marine Sciences uh, Conference uh, that has just been held here in Tarawana uh, and acknowledge uh, enormously the very generous support of the Bay of Regional Council uh, for that meeting. Um, so the, the theme, this was the first ever uh, conference with a Mataranga uh, Māori theme running entirely through it. Te tiro whakamuri, ko kiri whakamua, looking back to move forward because we've acknowledged that uh, for us to fully understand what we're dealing with in the marine environment um, and, and put in measures to enhance or, or uh, restore damaged environments uh, and also move to a blue economy that's sustainable. We need to um, pay acknowledgement and understand uh, the Mataranga in the round, uh, in the round of our nation. So that was the theme of the conference and it was embraced actually brilliantly by all of the speakers, I have to say. Uh, we we're really fortunate. Um, we were nervous. Uh, about running this in a, in a COVID climate. Uh, so we decided to keep it um, lean and mean, uh, but the Bay of Plenty Regional Council was the first sponsor, very generous, who, who came to the fore straight away, gave us a lot of confidence that we could run this, um, this very, very effectively. Porta Tauranga uh, also immediately leapt to the, the fore and gave us some very generous sponsorship. 
uh, Ministry of Crime and Industries, particularly the Fire Security, uh, MIWA Priority One, we're, we're large sponsors, but also Maritime New Zealand, Ministry of Transport, Portsmouth Institute, Department of Conservation, Fox Fish Research, which are dealing with underwater drones, we'll talk a little bit about that, National Science Challenge for the Moana Project, Plant and Food Research, who we link in with uh, enormously, along with Hawthorne and Toyo and my major sponsors. As I say, uh, we, we knew that we could lock down at any point. Um, a week before, of course, you might remember that the Wellington had a little bit of a turn. Uh, we kept things lean and mean. We told all participants not to expect too much, but they had a fantastic time. <laughs> we even used string <laughs> as the layers, just to keep us uh, on target with the cost. But um, it was really because of the, the major sponsorship that we had, uh, particularly here in Tauranga, uh, that allowed us to put on what is now being heralded by others, not us, as the best uh, conference ever. So I put in Tauranga for Regional Council, um, the biosecurity folks, uh, Cawthor Institute. We increasingly link in with the Cawthor Institute in this region for aquaculture, but all sorts of other elements uh, looking at the vibrancy and productivity of our marine domain, and also with plant and food research. I'll talk a little bit about some of the algal work that's been going on with them, remediating water and doing that uh, so that it's profitable. The Moana Project is alive and well uh, in the Bay, um, as you know, and we provide uh, linkage um, and facilitate a lot of the work that they do, particularly with the monitoring. It was interesting that the Moana Project and Sustainable Seas um, uh, and there was a meeting here in this very room the week before from Sustainable Seas. Most of the projects that are now funded by uh, these large national science challenges are happening within the Bay, which is kind of interesting. It's, it's showing that the focus of the nation is really here because of the innovation that's going on. Uh, and of course, we had magnificent support from the university. They gave us all of the rooms up in the new campus uh, for free, uh, which was a big benefit. Um, the conference allowed us to highlight um, the initiatives that are being gained, particularly in biosecurity, both on land and in the sea. This is the Tauranga Biosecurity Capital, which is a unique uh, entity. It was promulgated by, by Iwi, uh, linked in with the core company and all of the major research providers and indeed inter industry interests. And you can see the, the uh, participants and the sponsors for that. Um, it, it's now such a successful model, it's being mapped into uh, Taranaki and other ports in around the country. Um, and it also hi it was highlighted just last week when MPI, with their leadership team, uh, came up here with the Director General, talking about uh, model uh, and massive investment that they're going to be putting into the blue economy in particular, but importantly, sustainability. And this, the biosecurity elements that are a major feature of that. So it's not surprising that this... Uh, this aspect of science featured in the in the conference right away through. Uh, the event was the first ever very large event held at the new campus. We booked out the entire building. Um, almost all of the lecture theatres were used all the all of the time. And in addition to that, there were other events happening because it also coincided with orientation week. So it really challenged um, the, the capacity of the building, but it survived extremely well. These are some vital statistics. 475 attendees, so it's the largest ever national conference for marine in the country. We did four, uh, 249 talks in three days, uh, <laughs> an exhausting timetable. We kept everyone strictly to time. There were 62 posters. All of the talks and posters were different. Some people wanted to give two. Uh, we said, no, we've got too many, so they're all quite unique. There were six plenaries, and all of them were by prominent iwi spokespersons focusing on that central theme. 16 major iwi across the country, all of the iwi uh, in this region were represented. If you had a look at the collaborations that were represented in the presentations, 98 international agencies from countries spanning Uganda all the way through to the USA were represented. So even though it was a national conference, it was one face to face. At the same time, the Australians were having their marine conference, they just did it virtually. But we had uh, an international audience um, represented by those uh, different uh, international uh, countries. We had special sessions in addition to the talks. Um, uh, Maritime New Zealand and Ministry of Transport had a special session on green shipping, and that invoked uh, a biosecurity element. There were sessions, of course, from the National Science Challenge and Sustainable Seas. Innovation was a big part of this conference, <coughs> with talks about 
underwater water drains, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, shortly. Marine science and media, so outreach, improving ocean literacy. And then there was an operational um, session with scientific occupational health and safety, with workplace health and safety uh, officials coming up from Wellington, uh, so that we can continue to transact our business. Um, for most of us, our, our classroom is in the sea, our lab is in the sea, and we need to be able to do that safely, and but continue to do, do it both. There's a public lecture in amongst all of that on aquaculture futures by our own uh, Simon Wilcaster, who works with the University and Toya um, And that was looking at how we can do aquaculture, but actually make it sustainable into the future. And then the, the, just a note that there was one other conference, marine conference in Tauranguana, uh, it was 40 years ago. Um, it was held then at the Bay of Plenty Harbour Board offices in the Mount. I was there, it was my first ever um, marine conference. It was the worst talk I ever gave in my life. It was a real shocker. In fact, one of my slides burst into flames uh, during the thing. But um, it was interesting that at that conference, um, uh, there was a, a, a talk on the potential of offshore mussel farming oh. off of Potiki, way back then. Yeah. Um, now it's a reality. Uh, thanks to the, the very brave souls, the pioneers at Pocatoya and Tapana Atamu. Uh, there was also discussions about the plight of Makatu, the Makatu history and the flood state. So it, it's an, uh, just an interesting historical legacy from all of that. Uh, these are the plenary speakers. Rion Tuanu, who you all know, uh, fantastic, talked about Tauranga Moana, the cultural narrative. Jack Thatcher talked about um, passing on knowledge. Raymond Bennett talked about Makatu decolonising environmental restoration, an interesting topic given probably some of you are aware of the listener um, article and the hui just the other night, some interesting there. Clark Kopu from um, the Regional Council chaired that session. Takaha uh, Hawakidiangi uh, talked about uh, marine cultural health programs. Pedro Skipper uh, talked about the Waiheke Rahui, which was uh, really interesting, big Big discussion because of the um, prominence and immediacy of the Montiti Island um, protected area. Uh, Kura Paul Burke uh, from here uh, chaired that one. Tina Nata talked about plastics pollution and Te Rere Kuhu Tutu Rangi Fiu. He talked about um, uh, Waikaka Te Moana and uh, Linda Faulkner chaired that session. So this, this set the theme of Matsuranga well and truly right through the conference. And as I said, every other talk. Um, pay due homage and regard to Matauranga and the science that they're doing. So clearly, I think down here, we're living in a very different world than some of the people up in Auckland. Mm -hmm. So the sessions, they covered pretty much everything. Um, I won't uh, dwell on any of these other than pointing out that for the first time ever in one of these conferences, the Marine Sciences Conference has tended to be ecology. Um, but this time we had uh, molecular science coming in, we had innovation, we had aquaculture. So we succeeded in attracting all of the disciplines associated with marine science from conservation all the way out to making a living out of the sea um, and doing that sustainably. So for the first time ever, we had people meeting one another and sharing skills. So there's a lot of synergy and a lot of outcomes. It's really important for that. This little pop-up um, image uh, was interesting because we do have a couple of white sharks hanging around the harbour. It's another story for another day, but the, the conference covered everything from nematodes, trematodes, all the way to um, apex predators, sharks, and whales. Uh, the major iwi represented, as I say, all of the iwi in the region, but also all around the country uh, were there. Um, don't worry about this. This is just the list of international institutes represented, and the connections they all know right around the world where Tauranga is, Tauranga Moana, and just how vibrant it is because of the imagery that was shared. These are the presentations by category, and uh, once again, it, it just shows the huge breadth, first time ever that a lot of these disciplines have been discussed in a national conference of this nature. Everything from ecology, biodiversity, which also includes conservation, uh, major topics. But I put in kelp and algae there. Um, all of these other topics are really big fields, um, but there were specific talks, and a lot of them, in and around kelp forests and the, the problems that we're facing there, that we're losing our kelp forests. And algae is code for bioremediation of dirty water, be it fresh water or marine, um, but doing that in a way that, that creates opportunity, creates jobs, creates funding. 
you, you can make money out of paid work. And indeed, you're probably aware of the Tōpuki plant so that we open potentially tomorrow, but I don't think that's been it's postponed most of the yep, because of weather. Uh, but yeah, pollution, plastics in particular, mataranga, there's the same mataranga infused every one of those talks, so you can pile them all together. Um, but there were talks on mataranga specifically, um, and they, they were hugely well attended. Um, so what did we contribute? contribute? Well, just as a very quick snapshot, uh, this is what we, we talked about. We had about uh, 40, 50 or so of those talks from uh, students and staff who, in one way or another, are supported by the Bay of Plenty Regional Council. So, the, the, you know, uh, once again, uh, hats off, this is probably the only regional council in the country that really does support such a massive groundswell of research. So Estuary, Kaimoana, Restoration, Mataranga, and a night there, but our very own Vanessa Takato won the Mataranga Prize. Innovation, talk a little bit about that, as I say, shortly. Circular economies, algal byproducts, land sea connectivity, so joining the mountains to the sea. Trophic cascades, which is code for food webs, tipping points and phase shifts, and a very changeable marine climate. So this is just a couple of snapshots of some of the things that were discussed. A great deal of effort has gone in recent times um, into the market too. We harnessed the whole course actually a few years ago, first ever course of its type called Capstone. 10,000 hours were spent in the Makatu estuary before the river was re-diverted as a sort of a benchmark so we can look at change. So model work using radio or stable isotopes for tracking the connection uh, and the importance of the land to the sea. So some 40% of carbon that comes off the land is utilised in uh, primary productivity in the sea. So the, there is a very important connection to the sea. But this, of course, is mitigated by the amount of mud that might be coming out of some of these rivers. <coughs> Excuse me. Oops, it's a bit slow. One coming up. Um, and then there is a lot of focus in on the stability of marine systems and a changing climate because we know we are losing kelp forests. Um, we're getting these urchin barrens coming in. And the two shots on the right hand side, this is a, it's a native, but it occurs in Australia too, Central Stephanus, but it is taking over. It's enormously aggressive. Most of the New South Wales and Tasmanian seaboard is now denuded of cups, and the productivity is, is plummeted. Um, and we are seeing the first signs of these things uh, start to take over in this country as well. So there's also the issue of dirty water. Of course, plants need light. If it's money, they don't uh, photosynthesize and we're losing our cult for us here. So there's quite a lot of concern around the stability of our coast, the actual coastal zone, which of course affects fisheries and, and productivity. There's um, a big input this time in aquaculture, sustainable um, blue economies, environmental re remediation, and this is really a catch cry. We now are the centre for algal research and looking to the sea for novel solutions, for instance, to agrochemical uh, issues. You know about the, the PSA discoveries that have been made. That's continuing and it's very successful. So the, what you see in the bottom left there is the new Alba facility at Sulphur Point. It's the most sophisticated of its type, pretty much in the southern hemisphere, and it is a, leading to all sorts of commercialisation outcomes. Now, all of the red stars show where this research is now um, spreading right throughout the Today we talked about tapuki, but we also have a plant that's going to go in to remediate water at a potiki um, off the new mussel farm here, between a bit of bee. It's amazing what you can get done in a meeting at EPR. Yeah. 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 It's going to be brilliant. Yeah. And then we have also um, uh, operations all the way through to our company in Takaha. So that's working really well. It's a blue economy, it's a circular economy, it's, it's making use of waste. In the algal bioproducts, um, there's all sorts of quite valuable things, which is just to yeah. Let's quickly rush through that. So um, the engineering and science and computing, we can do that well here. So the University of Waikato has just opened up the Artificial Intelligence Institute. And here in Tauranga, we put together this thing called Nexus because we realised to do uh, to work efficiently to enhance productivity in the marine state, to monitor what's going on in terms of pollution, biosecurity, if we had robots to do it, it would be much more efficient, very much more cost effective. And I won't let this play all the way through. You might have seen some of this. This is a robots in the kiwi fruit industry where they just track along. They um, identify flowers and kiwi fruit in three dimensional space and memorize it using artificial intelligence. And then a, a pollinator 
all go through and go under these things and pollinate every single individual oh, flower. Wow. It's just incredible. So I won't, I'm not sure if I can speed that up, but um, if you can visualize instead of a kiwi fruit orchard, um, a muscle long line or wolf pilings, uh, that's, that's the plan, is we're going to create underwater remote vehicles that can just dock underwater, they can just stay out at sea. You can program them to go through long lines, you can program them to go through wolf pilings. With eDNA sensors, they can have a look for any nasties, invasive species, or they can, for instance, do dipsticks, so pop a little dipstick into a gaping muscle to see if it's got any paralytic shellfish poisons. So this technology is already here, it's on land, um, and we have the capacity with our engineers and AI people to move it into the sea. And so that turned out to be quite an interesting new part. So you just imagine that's, that's on land, you imagine that if that's an underwater an ROV, tri tripping on through wolf pilings. So the major outcomes, just to sort of summarize uh, up, uh, seaweed to science, uh, that is to the fore, and we uh, in this region are leading all of that by our industries. Innovation is a really big feature. Once again, we're at the forefront of that. Looking at the blue economy, so enhancing opportunity out at sea, sustainable, looking at creating new jobs. Um, then being aware of uh, changing climate. So everything is packaged to be climate change proofed. Um, the, I think the big takeaway that I noticed is that we saw you know, 240, 250 odd talks um, of the, the best talks and the best science being presented in the world, pretty much, for our region. Um, but they weren't connected. A lot of them weren't connected. So this is probably a priority area for us, is to connect up all of that knowledge and harness it. And just finally, there's a, just a couple of quotes. This is Tina Nata. Uh, these, these two quotes from the plenaries really, really stuck with me. Uh, she said, our, our good science should be science for good. It'll just as you bring it. And then Tereri Kogu, he said, um, and this was in relation to um, our endeavours to understand Mataranga. And, you know, um, for, for me as a Pakeha, you can respect Mataranga, but really it is, is, it is the, it belongs to Mana Whenua. But he said for that, be the best version of you, not a bad version of me, which I thought was pretty prophetic, in terms of our endeavours to understand and engage. So, just finally, a uh, very special thanks to you all um, for your unwavering support, both for the conference, but also everything we do here. Very good. Thank you. Good. Outstanding, Chris, thank you. Um, we have time for a few questions. Councillor Winters. Yeah, Chris, um, thank you for that. Um, so recently we've had a decision from the Environment Court that Regional Council is now in charge of a marine reserve off our coast. So was there any discussion about that, the transfer of powers from a regional, from MPI to a Regional Council in terms of monitoring reserves? Uh, yeah, there was, uh, in the, the talks that's focused on marine protection, um, they, they, that very question came up, and uh, I've also written some uh, a submission uh, to the the Miller the Muller, um, petition oh, yeah. Yeah, to the House of Representatives, yeah. and uh, yes, it's 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 a very lively topic. The the grounds for the opinion is that uh, EPI probably shouldn't be the people because there was a sub question here about um, how fisheries might be managed, um, but I think there was a lot of interest in uh, the. A review of the RMA uh, and the legislation which attempts, there's a gap in the legislation, it doesn't uh, respect or pay, uh, give effect to, I think, uh, Maui and Iwi interests and concerns, um, and all of that came out at the conference. So I think people are looking actually probably to the situation here uh, to create a precedent in how it might unfold. And it seems to a lot of us that with the review of the RMA, it will, be, it will take a bit of time, that there might be an opportunity to actually forge a new way of dealing with marine protected areas. Because the concerns were um, uh, with, with the Department of Conservation, there hasn't been a marine protected area put in place for a very long period of time. Uh, even though under the fisheries legislation, uh, it is possible to protect a particular resource in fisheries, but that hasn't happened. So I think there's acknowledgement that something quite special is happening here. Um, it's, it's been a rocky road, I think, for everybody yes. that you might acknowledge. But I think out of it, there's a lot of um, 
um, I guess, optimistic anticipation that there might be actually a new way of doing these sorts of things, particularly for large and connected areas, and particularly where uh, mana whenua interests and traditional mechanisms uh, for protection, rahui, uh, taihui, and so on, might be integrated into some of these uh, new models, new ways of operating. Cool. And, and I think the plenary on the um, waiheke rahui is particularly pertinent to, to that discussion. There's a lot of talk after that. That's not bad. Great presentation. Pleased with the outcomes that you've you got. Just on the question of Matau and Māori, um, obviously in Aotearoa, New Zealand, its understanding is evolving, and it's good to see it was a thread through the uh, presentations here, but you had quite a lot of international members zooming in or coming into the into the meeting. What's their view? Uh, because it must be must be some fresh ground for some of them internationally to try and get, come to grips with a thought around the likes of Matarama. Oh, that, that's a great question. Um, to some extent it is, but once again, they're looking to this country for leadership uh, along those lines. So most of um, uh, the practitioners of marine science around the world are acutely aware of First Nations interests. Um, a lot of those people you would have seen um, would link to Australian universities which is not surprising, we have very strong linkages there. And having worked there myself um, uh, over 12 years, uh, the uh, interests for Aboriginal rights have come to the fore, but only very, very recently. So um, in, in all contexts of science, uh, plus the legislation associated with science, the legislation in the um, conservation for biodiversity, for instance, um, the Goya Protocol, which uh, is um, some legislation, international legislation around genetic resources, they will pay due homage to um, countries of origin, to traditional ownership, as, as they call it over there. And so if you're, if you're in any of the sciences dealing with natural systems, there are these international caveats um, and instruments that you need to abide by. But Internationally, a lot of people are struggling to find a pathway and able to do that. So they look to this country actually for leadership uh, in that. And so we have very strong recognition um, of the role and the importance of Mataranga uh, and, and giving effect to nativity um, as well. And, and that's acknowledged actually internationally a lot more than some parts of this country, funnily enough. Um, so it, uh, this conference, I think, has gone a long way to really push just what can what can be learned and the benefits of really understanding, respecting, and engaging. So just two questions, uh, further questions, Councillor Nees and then Councillor Clark, and then I think we will have to uh, move on. So Councillor Nees, thank you, thank you, Chris. Uh, I was. Um, very disappointed not to be able to go to the conference, so it's wonderful to get that presentation from you. Um, my question follows on from Councillor Winters, um, because as well as the Natural and, and Built Environment Act that's been foreshadowed, there's also a Spatial Planning Act, which we'll be aware of, which is um, expecting us to look at not only spatial planning for our land masses, but for our coastal marine areas. And, you know, we know uh, um, a, a little bit about the Motiti protection area and also the um, Apotiki, um sort of aquaculture area, but there's so much else in our coastal waters that we really have no understanding of. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts about what we might need to do to prepare ourselves for the um, development of a marine spatial plan. Uh, once, once again, a fantastic question. Um, the, I think the way through this is to really think very quickly about a marine spatial plan for the entire uh, connectivity uh, right throughout the Moana Atoi, um, also invoking what's happening uh, with the land and what's coming out of the rivers and their connection between the estuaries and the coast. Um, it was attempted and I was, a part, I was part of the independent review committee for the Taitimu Taipari uh, marine spatial planning process in the Hauriki Gulf. Um, and that, uh, the, we had Charles Earle uh, on that panel. Uh, he is acknowledged as, as one of the grandfathers of marine spatial planning. He wrote the UNESCO and United Nations Guide to Marine Spatial Planning. He was part of that panel and said that at the time, the Hauriki Gulf Marine Spatial Planning exercise was the most ambitious ever 
internationally because it was attempted to be participatory. It, it had these roundtables and workshops, and it didn't quite get there in the end. And the reason for that, there was a pause uh, that was called by Mana Whenua. Um, and the reason for that is that there was still discussion, of course, in around settlement. And the argument that they bore, which was quite correct, was that how can we talk about a marine spatial plan where we haven't really identified the Rahi yet? So I think um, there's a, a lot to be learned from that Auckland and Haraki Golf experience that could be mapped quite effectively here. And I think the engagement that we have here is, is with, with Mana Whenua right throughout the region and also the other stakeholders. To some extent, we have Rina to thank for that. It's brought a lot of people together and they have a very high understanding of just what the environment can assimilate and what it can't. Uh, they, people know how quickly marine life built up around the around Otaiti, for instance, but also how quickly it disappeared again uh, when that was opened up. So I think we've got an opportunity to really do well with the marine spatial plan and I think that would lead the way through both in terms of <coughs> policy and uh, management of Motiti protected area, but also thinking about the um, long-term uh, productivity and sustainability of the burgeoning aquaculture that's going on, because there's connections there, muscle spat and what have you. We do have a lot of information, and you know, I think that's what I alluded to, that the data is there, we need to stitch it together, and then we can put it forward into a marine station. I think that's high priority. Final question, Councillor Clark. It's not more hands on. Chris, I'm totally aware of the massive amount of degradation caused by the expansion of the Kinabara and South and our particular offshore islands. Um, I'm pleased you alluded to it. Was there any context that may be able to reverse this process? Uh, marine protection is, is one of them. Yes, yeah, so you start to get a balance uh, with large fishes like snappers come through um, and craze, um, they will attack the kinnas. The, the black kinnas, um, the essential stephanus, they're a little bit more immune to uh, predation by craze, um, especially when they get bigger. They're much longer spines and snapper will think twice about tackling those unless it's a big one. But pretty much that's what it is. Uh, it, it's trying to restore some of that balance of that whole food web and, and then they'll start to go. Get the cow back. Thank you. Okay, so um, just to quote a few things back to you, Chris, um, something quite special is happening here in the Bay of Plenty. The focus for marine science is now here in the Bay of Plenty, which is an acknowledgement of the innovation that's happening here in the Bay of Plenty. Well, we would say to you, Chris, that that is in large part a tribute to you and the work that you have done and you have forged new frontiers like never before in your acknowledgement of mana whenua, mataranga Māori uh, is a huge, huge tribute to you. So again, councillors, could we just show our appreciation? <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. Yeah. Thank you. So we now, um, I'm going to move that that presentation be received, seconded by Councillor Clark. All those in favour, aye, aye. against and carried. We're now going to move to the Operating Environment Report. We're going to take this report as read. Can I acknowledge uh, the work that's gone into this, but the superb attachments which are attached to this report, and to those of you uh, in the gallery or who may be watching, I urge you uh, to have a look at these attachments because it shows you the hailstorm of reform that is hitting local government uh, and the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead, um, and acknowledging also that uh, the work of local government New Zealand uh, in terms of uh, this, these attachments. So we'll take the report as read. I'll now ask Namuta and Julie uh, to add to the report. Then I'll ask the Chairman, um, uh, Councillor Crosby, as President of Local Government New Zealand, uh, to add to the report anything that they would like to and then ask any councillors to briefly uh, maybe touch on any matters that they would like uh, to do so in terms of this operating. So without further ado, uh, Namuta, thank you. <clears throat> Tēnā koutou, councillors. Um, this report just covers the areas of influence um, which inform councils' policy, direction and work. Obviously, the scale and pace of reform is substantial. Um, you'll note in the paper that we include a number of areas that um, you've asked us to focus on in terms of 
um, during this reform time, looking at opportunities to partner, um, looking at opportunities to influence, and you'll be aware we have one person seconded to MFE. We are also working at multiple levels and um, providing advice to the regional sector and local government New Zealand, looking at opportunities to emphasise our value add, making sure that we are adaptable and flexible, and making sure that we actively monitor the operating environment for impacts into the future. Councillor Nees has identified those four key attachments. Of those attachments, I'll draw your attention to attachment four, the updated work program. And just note there are three additions to the work program. In the um, September workshop, we are also, will also be bringing you the sustainable home scheme design for discussion. And then in the October meeting, uh, we will seek your approval of, um, of the design for the sustainable homes. In addition, in the October meeting, we will also be bringing to you a change to the regional policy statement on housing bottom lines, and that's to implement the national policy statement for urban development. Um, we are required once the housing business assessments from the territorial authorities are publicly available, we are required to update our regional policy statement without a schedule one process. So just flagging that you know, we now understand the timing for that for Rotorua and Tauranga will be around August, September. So we're wanting to add that to the work schedule in October. Um, back to you. Julie, do you have anything you would like to add? Uh, thank you, Maureen and councillors. Um, just to let you know, just as um, the measure has updated you, um, some more things to add in there. And the schedule of legislative changes that we've provided, there's also a number of movements in the arrows to that. And yes, sorry. So um, the uh, Strategic Planning Act and the Natural Built Environment Act now, uh, it's not at the end of this year that we'll get the bill, it's early next year. And then um, the bill will turn into an act. Um, they're saying somewhere towards the latter part of the um, parliamentary electoral cycle. So um, literally on a day-by-day -day basis, we can update these documents, um, but to keep you updated with what's happening. So happy for any questions. Thank you. Perhaps we might leave questions uh, till a little bit later. So just ask the chairman um, if he would like to make any comments in terms of uh, the operating environment. Thanks, Chair. I'll try to be brief. Firstly, the raft of change and the expectation in terms of this change is a real challenge. Uh, it's a challenge in terms of resourcing for the community and essentially in the fresh water space and climate change space, it's essentially our rural communities. It's a challenge for councils. Uh, councils are suffering as a result of uh, agencies in Wellington having higher recruitment requirements, and a lot of those people are coming out of council, so, you know, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul sort of things. So everybody's under a lot of stress, but the expectation from the Crown remains the same in terms of delivery. In terms of the jobs for nature, the jobs for nature in terms of the allocation of funding under the DOC funding profile, most of that money has been allocated. So the format of the reference group we're recommending to ministers be changed to a body rather than overseeing policy or contributing to policy debate about how things are funded, that it's one that's referring or looking over the implementation uh, in terms of that large amount of money. The future of local government, regional sector is in, uh, has received the first draft, which I haven't seen yet, in terms of the regional sector's submission to the future of local government, which um, President Crosby is, is overseeing. overseeing. Uh, MPS, far fresh water. Uh, there's a farm plan, which is a, mentioned in your papers here in terms of farm plan discussion document. I think it finishes in September, I think, Julie. Starts in early July, so that's currently out for consultation. That's been a significant shift in terms of officials listening to industry and regional councils in terms of what's fit for purpose. And there are some other issues which, some other issues which I've taken confidential. Thank you, Mr Chairman. We'll pause for brief there and just ask at this stage do councillors have any questions, uh, either of Namut, of Julie or the Chairman? Then, Councillor Rose. Yeah, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just wanted to ask a question in regards to our uh, communities and that whether staff have looked into options around engaging our communities around the reforms 
Um, obviously, it's a it's a big space to be in, and there is a lot of change, and we want to ensure we've got everyone on board with us. So, have staff looked into any ways of um, engaging our communities in regards to some of these reforms? Uh, yes, that is something, uh, Councillor um, Rose, that we would like to do, and I'll be really honest with you, in terms of this exposure draft, that was something that we had hoped to do, and then when it came out, um, literally with no notice, and it has been a month, unfortunately we haven't, um, but some of our team have been talking to different um, groups and people that have, have asked questions, but this is a very good point, and this is something that uh, we would like um, to encourage government to allow more time for us to actually do that in, in those sorts of matters. I think that's a very good point. Thank you. Councillor Nays. Um, thank you. Just a couple of points. Just picking up on that question. Um, do we have a, a date when the um, future of local government independent panel are going to come and talk to us? Do, do we have a, a, a date for that? Because my question is, do we want, as a council, to go out and um, talk to communities about what that might mean for them and get some views from them um, that we could then perhaps feed back into um, the independent review panel um, so that they can actually include some of that thinking in their report? Staff don't have a, a date yet. We are to wear. It, it occurred to me some of us have been um, talking about this and expressing a desire to actually have some sort of forum by which we can um, flag this with our community. And it occurred to me that the LTNZ um, papers, the, the two diagrams and the appendices, would be an ideal resource to do that. And I just wonder if we could have a, an offline discussion on what whether the time frame would facilitate um, or provide us with the ability to do that, and if so, how we could get that underway. So that, that's um, one question. The other one is under the Three Waters Reform, what I didn't see mentioned in the paper was the fact, and I, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we also, as a regional council, will have responsibility for monitoring the safety of drinking water. Sources. So um, I just want to make sure that we're including that in our work program also, because that's a big, big piece of work. Um, and I just want to make sure we've got visibility um, around that. Yes, that is in our freshwater program, and I think it's even in that agenda item. Um, well, certainly uh, we have a meeting with our TLA um, Freshwater Collaboration Forum on Monday, and that is one of our agenda items in there, so it is something that we, we have a staff member um, working uh, on. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to totally endorse Councillor Nees's comments about the role that we and other local government um, agencies can play in facilitating uh, community uh, understanding and feedback into the future for local government. At the end of the day, local government is community government, governance, and actually we should be doing all we can to facilitate our communities actually having say in how they want local government to operate going forward. So I think, yep, certainly I think we need to be having that discussion on how best to facilitate the community's input uh, into the future of their government. So I uh, totally endorse that going forward. So no further questions, we'll pass to uh, Councillor Crosby, if you'd be good enough to give us an update. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be reasonably brief, but because um, the report is very comprehensive and, and covers a lot of the reforms and the various stages that they're at. But I will touch on a few things. Um, obviously, we had the local government conference in Blenheim um, last month, and there were some significant announcements there by uh, Minister Nanaya Mahuta, who was available for three days, actually, which was uh, incredible, actually, and, <clears throat> and spoke to a number of forums. So uh, essentially, there was a heads of agreement was announced between LGNZ and the government. That's not between the councils and the government, but the entity, um, which spoke about uh, a uh, a third way of working moving forward, not just for Three Waters, but actually for RM reform and future for local government. To me, that was the more important part of 
uh, the agreement in terms of a genuine partnership and uh, how we work together, rather than just standing on the sidelines and shouting, which we have tend to be in the position before that we're actually in the room trying to shape for the best interest of the community's good legislation. Uh, but there was also obviously a support package with regard to the three waters, which does not involve regional councils, but the 67 uh, TLAs, uh, which had a figure around 2.5 billion. 500 million of that was for no worse off, and this has been a key concern to the 67 TLAs if these now known four water entities um, go ahead, that uh, there are stranded overheads and a whole lot of hidden costs. So the government has recognised that and have put quite a substantial sum um, to address that. There was also a, another sum of about $2 billion that was for a better off package of which half a billion will be available from the 1st of July uh, 2022. And that's essentially been allocated already through a formula, um, which was publicly known and was announced um, at the conference and all the details went out uh, straight away. And this is really to start to move towards what the future for local government could look like um, in terms of developing partnerships uh, with the government in terms of um, seamless delivery from central government to local government to community. So that's actually, uh, in my view, quite exciting. And I acknowledge the government have brought that forward um, a good probably 18 months to two years because uh, the Future for Local Government report doesn't go to government until April 23. Uh, and then who's not, who knows what's going to happen to it after that. Um, so this initial investment, um, in my view, creates an enormous opportunity to prove what local government can really do in terms of extra support to their communities. Uh, but with regard to the Three Water Program, the TLAs have to the 1st of October to um, consider and analyse and challenge and question the data that's been provided to them and a lot, lot of other information. Uh, consultation advice, as I understand, went to the CEOs yesterday evening or early this morning, so that's a critical part to the process in terms of how councils will engage and consult with their communities on what's essentially one of the biggest asset transfers in New Zealand, and we shouldn't forget that, uh, from local councils to these proposed water entities. Uh, Tamata Arawai is, um, is moving along with the uh, Water Services Bill. Um, there's been a lot of submissions to that and we submitted to it as well. Um, as the chair said and, and staff, you know, there are some significant issues in there in terms of um, potential obligations and responsibilities to regional councils and TLAs if these uh, independent water server, independent, um, you know, non-council water entities, and it could be two or more, um, uh, Rene or can't, can't um, comply. Uh, where does it fall? Or probably back onto the councils at this stage. And, and again, um, another unfunded mandate. So there's a whole lot of issues around that. Uh, but the CEO did indicate to us very clearly that they're going to take a pragmatic approach, which is good, uh, for these now known over 90,000, I think, suppliers. They thought there was about 15,000, but every week it grows. Uh, so they'll take a very pragmatic approach, but what they um, will not resile from is uh, compliance to a standard, and that will fall back a lot of that onto the regional councils and our traditional roles in, in water, wastewater and stormwater, so let's not forget that. Uh, with regard to RM reform, again, I think the report highlights where we're at with that in terms of submissions to the exposure draft for the MBA uh, Act, proposed Act, and we know what the key issues there are. One of the, I think, what's starting to come out of that, again, the sequencing of these three acts is potentially back to front. In fact, it's quite a lot of issues happening at the moment that we think are slightly back to front. Um, but however, it is what it is. So one of the key um, um, submissions that LGNZ will be making is uh, that potentially the Special Planning Act should come first, which is a broader, holistic uh, look at uh, regions in particular, and then flow down to the um, to the um, MBA Act. And the third one is with regard to climate change adaptation 
adaptation and retreat, etc. So that was a sequencing issue, but within the current proposal, um, there are some issues also around community, which we spoke about before. Uh, where does the community land in terms of being able to participate in these proposed regional plans, uh, regional council plans, or regional plans? Uh, that again is probably the biggest one, but again, it seems to be a little rushed and sure it's only an exposure draft, it's not the bill. Uh, and I do, you know, feel feel for um, um, the staff down in Wellington who are trying to keep pace with all of us. With regard to the future for local government, I would encourage you to start that conversation sooner rather than later with communities. It's an open book, actually, very much an open book. Um, sure, the commission's there and they're travelling around. And I think the in Rotorua, I think, was the first or the second one, uh, which a number of us went to. And LGNZ is also facilitating um, workshops uh, within our zones and sectors to get um, uh, our elected member colleagues' heads into that space, what the opportunity uh, could be. I guess if you want to just focus on page 25 of, it really does, of our agenda, it does show you the schedule of legislative changes uh, that are here. And what I will finally say is I do support the chair in this. We are seeing you know, uh, a lot of pressure and stress coming into not just the local government sector, but the central government sector and starting to filter through communities now. You're seeing that coming through with rapid change and people are feeling somewhat disengaged at times from that change. So if you look at our own local government sector, you know, um, business as usual has been pretty tough with COVID and uh, other things. And then there is um, the 10 year plan, which has put an extra layer of complexity on it, which is nearly resolved. And then they have to implement it. And then there are um, uh, events that weren't planned, be they natural events or other events. And now you've got this rapid and significant overlay of policy change at the same time. So yeah, people are feeling um, under the pump. And one of the biggest risks when you rush stuff through is you don't give yourself enough thinking time, you don't give yourself enough engagement time with the people you should be engaging with, um, and the quality of the legislation could be compromised, in my view, uh, when, when you rush stuff through like this. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Crosby, any questions or comments from councillors, Councillor Winters? Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've been invited by the Chair to attend a meeting in Taupo tomorrow. Uh, it's essentially the Three Waters Review of Entity B, and I'll be attending along with Alex Miller and its mayors and chairs across Entity B. There's about 80 of us going so far, so just to advise Council on attending on Regional Council behalf, just to... Um, Hear what's going on, but I've just heard it from the horses. No, sorry, I shouldn't call you horses now. But just thank you, Stuart, for that. That's some good key messages that we need to take back to that session tomorrow. Thank you for that. Thank you, Councillor White. Yes, just to add to Councillor Winter's comment, um, just over a week ago, I attended a uh, Iwi Leaders Forum that was called by Area B or Zone B, Taranaki, Tainui, and Bay of Plenty, on how they wish to try and navigate the space. Um, they've come to a view, understandably, that they need to act collectively. Yeah. And so uh, they are, they have, they've been acquiring mandate across those domains uh, to develop a leadership group that will focus the attention on the conversation uh, in a cohesive way, which I think would be valuable in the context of, of uh, as we navigate the space and how we connect with EWI across that domain. Um, so that's, uh, that's happening. And I'm, I would say, it's happening in other parts of the Motu as well. Thank you, Councillor Wyatt. Further questions or comments? Councillor Brown? Well, just con a concern about, you know, these are government initiatives uh, that we are responding to as we are required, but just how we then deal with our communities for what is a government responsibility, we could very well be the meat in the sandwich. Yes. And how do we get out to our communities? Um, and talk to them because I think they are cottoning on. Uh, they are going to respond in a fairly big way that may not be constructive. 
Thank you, Councillor Brown. Councillor Thurston. Um, just leading on from Councillor Brown's comments, can you comment on the growing move for referendum? Hold on. Squire out there, and yes. we say that I did reply to a local gentleman on that. Um, at the moment, as I said, uh, the next two months are focused on due diligence by the councils, um, and uh, post that, there will be another government announcement, and I don't know what it will be uh, post October. And at that point, when councils are proposing to make a decision, and at the moment they're deemed, this is the 67 local authorities, they're deemed to be opted in. Now, whether they choose to stay in or go, then that will trigger absolutely under the Local Government Act a consultation process. And that um, view has been circulated to the CEOs. Now, councils could do it tomorrow if they wanted to, another day. In terms of referenda, that's a tool of many tools uh, in terms of um, consultation, but the key with any referenda, and I've had a few myself over fluoride and water meters, as an example locally here, is quality information. And that quality information is not there yet at this point in time. Uh, there is still actually more analysis of data uh, in terms of three waters uh, to come out of um, the government uh, in terms of the individual um, information to councils. They've got they got a high level, they got their local level, but there's still more to come. Um, so at a point in time, yes, those councils, when they are at decision time or opposing a decision, they will definitely have to engage. Um, and there are many techniques of doing that, of which referenda is one of them. I wouldn't rush into one tomorrow because you wouldn't know what you're making a decision on. Uh, but at a point in time, uh, there are councils proposing to hold them. Further questions or comments? A closing comment, you have never seen a hailstorm of reform hitting like this, and that would include the 1989 reforms. So this is unprecedented, and as the Chairman has very eloquently outlined, the challenges for uh, communities, for Māori uh, participation, uh, for councils and for central government agencies is unprecedented. And um, I guess the challenge for all of us is how you do turn challenges into opportunities. And I think we've discussed here today that one of the things that we can do is to really take on board our role to facilitate community having voice and choice in the future of their local governance and government. And I hope that we really pick up that mantle and move forward. But by goodness, it's challenging times but let's make them opportunistic time. So again, uh, thank you to the staff, uh, and I think the report's excellent, and I urge those of you who are interested in this to really have a good look at those um, attachments. And um, I want to thank, obviously, the Chair and uh, Councillor Crosby and others for your input. And uh, in doing so, I will move the report. It will be seconded by Councillor White. No further discussion, I'll put it all those in favour, aye, against, and carried. <coughs> so we're now going to move to Bay of Connections uh, update and welcome Dean. Um, and Dean, you will do your introductions. Um, Dean, we've, we've, we've got a little bit of a deadline. Uh, we know you're going to do, and we're looking forward to your presentation. We're going to take the report as read. Uh, but um, over to you, and um, you could, Tim Hurdle. Tim Hurdle, I beg your pardon. Thank you. So over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillors. Um, thank you very much for your time. We're going to get my public against the agenda, so we'll um, try and watch your discussion again. Um, we'll see, obviously, I'm uh, introducing Tim Hurdle, who's the Chair of the Patients Leadership Group. Um, Tim has been appointed uh, very late last year, so he's effectively been in the role since January this year. Report. We'll just um, go through some of these slides. Um, can you flip through this the agenda? Uh, so, uh, just a little cover off of where we've been at, some of the key projects, obviously, in the regional economy, um, so our vision for a low carbon economy moving forward, and also some of our work program that's about to roll off. Uh, so just in terms of sort of our six twelve months and the guys for being in this role, um, we can focus on the regional recovery. Um, COVID obviously uh, affected our economy 
Roy Shotley initially, um, from the Ellipse that recovered reasonably well. Um, my backpage as well was around. Excuse me, Steve, have you got your mic on? That's just the only mic that I've got. Yeah, I yeah. think, uh, yeah. Thank you. Well, yeah, trapped the young place. Um, yeah, so that mentioned has developed a regional recovery framework, um, working with a lot of our different uh, stakeholders around the region, just to pull together a lot of the common threads that we were seeing. Um, a big part of that was that we recognised our role very much around connection and communication. Everyone's very focused on what was happening in their own backyard. Uh, so our role is to make sure that people had an opportunity to connect where they needed to, share um, concerns, issues and the like. And where there were two or more organisations working on a similar challenge, we could help connect them up so they could then move forward and uh, address that problem together. Uh, the data project is a big piece that's been going on, and I'll just speak to that in a separate slide. Um, and also in the last few months, very much developing our sort of forward work program. Uh, that takes a lot of investigatory work, um, testing different areas and other issues that arise um, along the way, uh, particularly some around forestry and wood processing, which I can speak to as well. Uh, within the leadership group itself, obviously Tim came on board in the new chair role and Andy Blair stepped down. Um, had another member join recently, Tony Owen, who's uh, based out of the Eastern Bay of Plenty. Uh, so we've got a good mix of members from across the region, although they're not necessarily representative of those uh, specific regions. So uh, I'll let Tim talk to the leadership group a little bit more as well. Uh, yeah, no, so there's, there's a very um, diverse range of people on there from uh, uh, Tom and Taylor engineers to um, governance experts and a very strong uh, EU representation. Um, and I think that means that we have a diverse range of thought. Um, one of the focuses is really providing the connection between uh, the business community, the economic thinking of the Bay uh, and local government so that we are sort of um, seem to um, engage with business and with priority one with the EDAs and taking those issues and looking at them from a regional lens, I think um, quite often people can fall into a, uh, well, that's my area, that's what we're doing, and we're very much um, been focusing on not getting into competing with those organisations, but actually finding the benefits where there's an application at a regional level for economic activity that sits below that central government that's for the benefit of the Bay, but doesn't compete with those sub-priorities. And that took, took a while just to understand where that space is, but there is quite a substantial space, and I think the data project is a good example of that. So we'll talk about that shortly. Thank you, uh, Yes, so the data project uh, is led out by Jackie Ross and Steve. Um, this is something that um, has been in place since February 2020, so um, very good timing in terms of COVID. Uh, during that lockdown period and immediately after, there was um, actually insatiable demand for data. Everybody wanted to know everything about everything. Um, and but as part of that, we realise there's actually limitations of data availability and accessibility, um, both in timeliness of data, granularity. So a lot of organisations want um, data at a district level, but sometimes it's only available at a national or a regional level. Um, you might want monthly data, but it might only be released quarterly or annually. Uh, so we've actually been working a lot with central government around how we might access a lot of the data that they have uh, a lot more. Uh, frequently and to get that sort of level of granularity that people need. I'm um, doing a lot of support with our stakeholders. Um, Jackie's done a couple of big projects with Toy Kaurara recently and Toy DA as well. We've supported them. Um, they have obviously resource constraints, so um, it's great to help those organisations. And particularly interim regional skills leadership group, they were doing a big data piece, so we fit into that as much as we could um, to save them duplicating all the work in um, many ways. Uh, we share a lot of our data through our, our features newsletter and social media pages and the regional data group that Jackie convenes is quite useful. Um, another upshot of COVID is that a lot of data positions were put in place. Uh, so convening that group to get shared knowledge, having guest presenters in place and actually agreeing common data sets. People want to promote data about their region so we ought to make sure that the data that's being put out there is actually consistent so you're not getting sort of different messages from each region. Is there anything you want to share on that? Yeah, and I think it's an important thing to realise that um, by taking down those walls between organisations, people have got a better understanding of what data is available um, and that information is shared in, and often data sets um, that they didn't know about or that they couldn't afford are, are brought to, to, into the realm and that really is um, leading to some good connections. I think um, we all recognise with the growth of the digital economy and with the growth of um, the way our uh, 
information decision making is going that data is the future. So I see that this is a project that will only uh, probably grow and become more common um, as information sets become available uh, to assist people like yourselves in understanding where, where trends are, where things are happening and what needs to be focused on. Uh, so just in terms of what we're seeing in the regional economy, sorry, do you have a question? I think we'll, can we do, what, okay. yeah, we'll save questions. Yes. Save questions. Uh, just in terms of the regional economy and what we're seeing, um, a lot of this is in the report, but um, obviously we've got a good sector mix, some of those sectors have performed quite well, and actually with the um, exception of international tourism, um, yeah, things are looking pretty good, domestic tourism is, is quite good, however, that's very much a weekends and school holidays market, so uh, Monday to Thursday is uh, very much... Um, that's where the, where the challenges are around there. Um, sometimes when we aggregate up that regional picture, you mask a lot of that sub-regional disparity, um, and that's where some of that reporting and the data can, can sort of highlight some of those uh, areas where different uh, challenges remain. Um, just pulling out a couple of challenges, um, you know, a report about economic, the economy is uh, completely about housing. Um, it's not something we play in ourselves, but it can be actually a barrier to people attracting talent. And the labour market is probably the single biggest um, concern, I think, for EDAs and like around our region at the moment, uh, that talent attraction. But equally, we've got this um, typical space where there's a lot of jobs coming in, but job seeker numbers are equally um, are quite high. So matching up the skills and, and demand is quite difficult. Um, the regional skills leadership group has done some work in that space, but that's primarily around horticulture, um, healthcare, forestry sectors. Um, I've just gone through the interim phase and watching the full regional leadership skills group um, from sort of late August, September. Uh, so that's going to roll off and they will put in place some workforce development plans and we'll be feeding into those. Uh, the other big uh, announcement in the last couple of months is around Kanawa Regional Economic Development and Investment Unit, which is the former provincial development unit, and the Regional Strategic Partnership Fund, which is uh, the successor to uh, Provincial Growth Fund. Uh, so we've gone from a $3 billion fund down to $200 million. Um, Kano is working through what the regional priorities are at the moment with a group of uh, different stakeholders across the region. They've set up a uh, regional economic development partnership group and they're using the interim regional skills representation group for that and some other um, stakeholders, central government agencies and the like. Um, recently just been through a workshop where they've identified what some of those priority areas might be and it's very sector focused. That's probably about all I can share in the next space around there. Tim, did you want to add anything? Yeah, uh, just a couple of things. I mean, uh, we are seeing a, uh, in an aggregation a reasonably resilient economy, um, particularly because of our strength of horticulture and agriculture. Uh, but there are those uh, areas like tourism that are continuing to um, have, have considerable pressure. Uh, and I think we also need to be very mindful of the ongoing threat of uh, COVID, I believe, from some of the work I'll be doing in other areas, the Delta variant has a high probability of getting through the border and that could cause some quite significant um, impacts on our economy if we go into further lockdowns and those sort of scenarios that we thought we'd leave behind. And I think the other thing is um, the unwinding of um, the fiscal and monetary stimulus by the central, um, central government um, will have, have an impact as that starts to unwind and um, and we see higher interest rates and, and uh, Fiscal stimulus. Uh, so I just included one chart around the labour market, which just sort of shows some of that regional disparity. Um, so those are sort of uh, job seeker numbers uh, by district. Um, so you can see that um, some districts are obviously a lot, have a lot higher uh, job seeker numbers than others. Um, so these are sort of the first things that you can lose when you aggregate data up a little bit. So, uh, so moving forward looking into our work program, um, we're very keen to um, look at our focus here around transition to a low carbon economy. We think there's a great opportunity to position the Bay of India as New Zealand's low carbon economy. Um, we've got a great sector mix. We've got some uh, obviously renewable energy resources and geothermal and some great innovation going on around hydrogen and other sort of areas that spaces, and obviously Chris and the Marine Science team are sort of leading some of that space. Um, yeah, so that's what we'll be working out and I'll work through and I'll talk some about um, programs uh, just in the next couple of slides. But um, 
you know, our work program really much is founded on this vision that we want to go to with this low carbon economy, and it obviously aligns to the Regional Council's Climate Change Action Plan, uh, supporting that transition to a smart, innovative, low carbon regional economy, and raising awareness and engaging our community. A lot of our uh, projects in the next uh, few months are very much around raising visibility of a lot of the work that's going on with different people around the region and different stakeholders. It's not something that we, um, so I think yeah, our role is very much to um, highlight the work that others are doing, bring those together and around key things and like. And I don't think that's a, a good point, Dean, particularly um, as, a, as a leadership group rather than a, um, you know, a, a people that dictate people what to do. One of the most important things we can do is provide leadership in our community, um, particularly in the business community, around um, the transition not being seen as a, a trade-off between economic growth and environmental outcomes, but actually a, a positive relationship. And a good example of that would be something like the waste um, streams that we have, where I believe um, New Zealand has very high amounts of um, waste from house building. 25% of the building materials on an average building site are going into the, into the skip. Uh, you get that down to 10 percent you get not only a commercial gain you get a productivity gain and you get a waste gain and sort of trying to get that sort of um, understanding that these things aren't a trade-off that they are actually a bonus for everybody um, will transform and lead to faster change and uh, you know gain greater support for the kind of work that you're doing here uh, in the interest of time i won't actually talk too much of these i'll just highlight them uh, so obviously our big sort of key projects around regional cycle network strategy, uh, which we're currently in the of working on, uh, low carbon construction forums, it's around great use of engineer timber and design construction, uh, waste workshop, um, the regional waste stock take is almost finalised, um, and there'll be a workshop with councillors and other stakeholders uh, mid September, we're thinking the time of that, and a decarbonising industries forum uh, that really will bring together a lot of those key things visibility to the work that's going on. So, thank you. Well, thank, thank you, um, Dean and Tim. That was uh, excellent. The report was really interesting. So now we're going to have questions. Questions from Councillor Clark. Thank you, guys. I'm just interested in the prospect, say, a year out when an enormous number of the young tradies go to Australia. I know several young guys sitting on 35 bucks an hour in Tauranga. Just got $55 an hour off and off to Australia. In terms of lifts, they're off, coupled with a 20% increase in building materials. Let's have your current construction. Do we plan on that? I think planning at that very local level is is down to what EDAs and the like. So, um, but I know it is a real concern at the moment, um, particularly with Australia, um, to be poaching and stuff. And across a number of sectors, so yeah, it's it's something that's um, it's on everybody's radar. Um, but in terms of that, on very local level, level, that's that's very much a PDAs and other local duties. I think also um, that is something that we we were speaking with the regional skills leadership group is supposed to be doing the the, the work around um, matching demand and supply um, in the labour market. But that's something that we have to be signalled, especially in light of some of the immigration settings that are going on right now. Um, I think we're all seeing that increasingly that there is a mismatch between the inflow and the outflow of, um, of skilled labour into New Zealand. And I think the unemployment numbers that we saw there, you can see from those numbers that there's a mismatch between skilled and unskilled labour. They probably hide the fact that there's a massive shortage of um, skilled and trades um, already um, without, without them starting to go to Australia for double the wages and, and think factors like that. So Councillor Nees and Councillor White. Thank you. I was really uh, pleased to mention the construction waste issue because um, I'm aware that there's um, people in Toronto developing houses that are very frustrated. There's no scheme here to enable them to practically recycle the construction waste. And it occurred to me when I read um, your work streams about the decarbonising construction work stream and the waste work stream, how they could come together to facilitate some progress on this. But I also noted that um, there were two major grants um, made recently, I think one to Wellington and one to um, an area up north um, to actually establish a construction waste scheme. Is, is that something that you've thought about? Because I just think there's a frustration within some of the developers that there's no go for it. They talk to Karen City and nothing's happening. Uh, yes, there was actually 
the drive for our interest in a waste um, project actually came from construction waste and around them, as part of those investigations we realised that Toronto City Council were getting some funding for redeveloping Tamonga and a, part of, and a big part of that is going to be having a unit around um, demolition and construction waste. So we found that out relatively early on but we had to wait for it to be publicly announced. Um, so hence why there's a little bit of delay in us coming up through there. Uh, obviously with that regional stock take um, being undertaken as well. So, so we feel now's the time to really um, trigger it. Yeah, we've got, we've got a few ideas too that we'll be just uh, at the early stage and won't bring to the table just now. But really, again, I'm trying to emphasise that scenario of uh, understanding that more efficiency can actually be both a commercial gain as well as an environmental gain. So that therefore driving some commercial behaviour towards um, uh, more efficient use. Productivity in the construction sector is um, considered the bottom sector for, for digital um, transformation and if you go onto most building sites um, you don't see a lot of laptops, you don't see a lot of laser, you've only just started seeing laser lights um, and I think that's going to be a real question uh, for these guys in the future is how do we create the environment that they will want to invest in the capital to have more efficient building techniques which can reduce waste and and, and, and better resource recycling. So, you know, rather than worrying about what's going on the skip, not put on the skip in the first place. Councillor White. Um, Toi Kairoa, they have been obviously accessing data uh, through Bayer Connections and working on different projects. How's the connection to Bayer Connections and Toi Kairoa, how's that going? Is, is there mutual connects and interests happening in that space? Is it a good connect or? Yeah, that is a good connection. Um, we um, we talk to them quite regularly and look at the projects they're working on. Um, yeah, so the data space is something that I've been very keen to access from both connections point of view. Um, um, I think I talked to me the other day if they've got a digital project they want to work on, but I haven't had a chance to catch up with on that space. But yeah, we we keep across what they're doing and, and we work together quite well. So. The questions or comments from councillors? See the report. Uh, thank you. Do I have a second to Councillor Rose? Further debate or discussion? I'll put that all those in favour. Aye, against and carried. Um, Tim and Dean, thank you very much for the report. Um, I, I think we need to acknowledge that you 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 now have your strengths, and it's. Um, I thought the report read really, really really well. I'm really interested in your comments, Tim, around the trade off issue. We shouldn't be seeing any of this as the need for draconian trade offs but rather just and positive trend, you know, transformation and transition. So thanks for your part uh, in this, and we look forward to further presentations and dialogue. Thank you very much. Councillors will now adjourn for um, a cuppa, and we will uh, be back at 10 past uh, 11. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, councillors. We're going to uh, reconvene and we're going to be considering the Climate Change Action Plan Report. And you will have had a revised, updated copy. Uh, Madam Chair, the updated copy doesn't. Is it, can, can someone just explain? So I've read the original. Where has it changed? Certainly. So. Um, welcome, Jane and Chris. Um, so, Jane, you'll be able to address that after you've gone through, will you, or do you want to do that now? Uh, I will try. There was yeah, a number of changes. The, the ones I spotted, Councillor, were we'd, we'd missed the science bit at the end, and there was a slight structural change in that we shifted some of the pages around because it made more sense that way. So it is 99 point something percent the same. Thank you. Um, Chris, so welcome. And um, can I just say on behalf of us all, thank you very much for the work that's uh, actually gone into this. So without further ado, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Tanakota Katoa, uh, so this article is about the adoption of the revised Climate Change Action Plan, um, which has been updated to reflect the decisions made um, by you through the long-term plan process and the funding that you've um, assigned to the specific climate change projects, along with the adoption of the climate change statement. So 
essentially, I'll take the papers read. I've got a couple of slides, just very brief ones, that I'll just run through some of the key changes. Um, yeah, so apologies for the incorrect version that was in the agenda. So the corrected version will be um, replaced to pages 49 to 64 of the agenda, and that will be available online by the minutes as well. So the revised action plan is essentially giving our full overview of climate change across council. Um, it goes from the high level vision and objectives that's within the statement that you adopted through the long term plan, and then has identifies four key goals and then gives details of 19 actions um, that are specifically focused around climate change. So, this is guiding climate change work across council. So, one of the key changes you will have seen is um, the cons consolidation of our goals in the action plan. So the original action plan from June 2019 had 12 goals. We've consolidate, consolidated those down to four, um, just to sharpen the focus on the key areas. So we now have one goal that looks at the corporate side of things, so the net zero carbon by 2050. Um, so that's where things like the um, sustainable procurement policy, um, climate risk reporting also sits alongside our 22 um, certification and audits. And then the other three goals take a more regional focus, um, so emphasising that working in partnership with stakeholders in our community, um, including our TAs, of course, on various actions across mitigation and adaptation. Um, so the work on adaptation that's already underway is a good example of that, where we're working in an integrated way with our TAs um, to develop a risk assessment um, process for the region. Um, on the mitigation side, we've got initiatives such as the FutureFit tool, which will be looking to work with RTAs in terms of getting um, our community to um, prepare carbon footprints and take actions to reduce their emissions. Um, the 19 actions within the action plan link to one or more of these goals. Um, and we've also brought in um, an operational section for the action plan, which um, connects to those areas of climate change that are delivered through other activities across council. So that's where, um, for instance, in transport space, we see the electric buses and the um, emissions reductions targets that we've got in the RRTP. Um, and of course, there's also linkages, as you heard earlier on, through their connections and the work that they're doing there. Um, so uh, monitoring will be um, reporting back to the Monitoring Not Committee every six months. Um, so the first report back will be next month. Um, we've already got projects underway. Um, the adaptation project will be carrying over from last year. Um, you'll also be hearing from Santiago later on the agenda about the Sustainable Home Schemes, which is one of the other projects that are listed in the action plan. Um, so it's an action plan for the next three years. It'll be revised in line with the next LTP, um, with obviously checkpoints of the annual plan process. Um, so essentially this is pulling together that climate change decisions that you made through the LTP and is going to guide our climate change working council for the next three years. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, um, Jane. So questions, I have Councillor Nees, then Councillor Winters. Um, thank you. Uh, my question is, um, can we have some minor adjustments to this document? Is, is it too late if we've got any suggestions to, for minor changes? I'm happy to take suggestions. Okay. Um, well, before I um, talk about those, uh, firstly, I want to say congratulations. It's a really nice document, um, and I think it's really clear, and I think it's really helpful. Um, one thing that concern me when I read the actual cover and report was that it said that um, there was no in, in intention of engaging with our community further because we consulted with them during the long-term plan and that was right at the end of the report. And um, I was uh, thinking that I don't think that that's what we should be saying or thinking um, because we have um, 
uh, an objective too. Community awareness and, um, is, is a key objective for us and our first transformational shift is an engaged and aware community and that doesn't happen in a vacuum. So I would expect that a core part of our work is actually engaging with our community and, and getting them to understand what the issues are and um, what they can do about it. So I would hope um, that we are active in that and I hope that we would have a, a, um, a an action which is about our community and I, I sent through to staff and some other elected members um, a discussion that was held at the uh, Regional Council's climate change discussion recently where um, some work had been done on a website, um, now's the time I think it was called, um, which was a vehicle to engage with the community and this has been developed without branding so anybody can pick it up and implement it. And I hope that that's one action that we would look at and um, pull into this action plan. Um, the next uh, thing that oh, there was wording on the second page in the introduction where it says the Climate change is unknown in, in terms of its scale and its extent. I think uncertain is a better word um, as to unknown um, because um, unknown, I, do, I just think uncertain means that it's going to happen, but we just don't know how big the scale is as opposed to unknown. We don't know whether it's going to happen. So that would be one minor suggest, suggestion. The other thing is um, um, we mentioned Whakatani District Council and Rotorua District Council and that we're working with them. I'm very conscious of the fact that Tauranga City in their submission to us in the long-term plan um, asked that we work with them um, and that they're going to, uh, I think they're receiving their climate change strategy in, in August and I think that it would be quite nice to explicitly mention, you know, we're working with all of our TLAs, not just Whakatani and um, Rotorua. And I'm sure that's what you intended. But I think we've got a major piece of work ahead of us with Tauranga City because it is an area where, you know, there is, you know, a huge population and huge issues around um, carbon emissions. Um, we don't look at the list of, of projects, <clears throat> I was surprised not to see some of the Bay of Connections projects recognised in them and here. There is the Tourism Bay of Plenty Low Carbon Economy Programme, but there's, we've just heard a lot of the other work that's been um, being done. And, you know, we are indirectly funding quite a bit of that, so I would really like to see some of those reflected um, in our actions. Um, and under our um, current work streams, we talk about uh, community engagement, and I've already talked about how I think this is a major stream of work for us. You mentioned youth, but I really would like that emphasise that we're going to do a lot more about engaging with our wider community on the issue. And lastly, um, under policy and planning, I think we need to be mentioning spatial planning and the work that we're going to be doing in that area because there's going to, I think, believe there's going to have to be a resilience layer, um, perhaps a carbon, uh, climate change action layer. Um, we haven't seen the legislation yet, but we've also got the um, the bill coming out. We've got the um, the uh, national budget, and I would. My expectation, this is the carbon emissions budget, my expectation is that we're going to have to be doing work about a regional um, a carbon emissions budget. And the fact that this is, I assume it's going to be a living document, but you say the next review is in three years. So much is going to happen within the next three years. I think we need to have something in the document which reflects that it's a fast-moving area. There's going to be a lot of requirements that are going to be um, expected from us and that we're going to have to be responsive and do a lot of um, planning and important decision making in this space going forward. So I'm sorry that's a bit longer than I expected. It's quite a bit shorter than I expected, so <laughs> <laughs> thank you Councillor Lees. I've got Councillor Winters and then Councillor Clark, then Councillor Rose. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm looking at page 57 of the agenda, which is this um, diagram here. Okay. 
Um, three things on that diagram. Summary of overall gross emissions in the source, excluding forestry, 15, 16. I, know, I know, understand that 15, 16 is our baseline, but I, is there any more up to date in terms of how does that change? Why are we excluding forestry? Because I look at forestry and I think, hold on, they're a big user of transport to get their products to the port or whatever. And overall gross emissions, why aren't we using net emissions as, as the from each industry? I don't know. Three questions. Through you, Chad, I can respond to those. Um, so the carbon footprint is the current one that we have, which is being updated. That's one of the actions in the action plan. So we will have that updated for the 2019-20 year. Um, that will be coming through this year. They're not doing 2021 because of COVID. Um, the forestry issue, it's it's and that links to the gross question as well. Um, so it's forestry in terms of the carbon sequestration from planting. So it's um, that's not included in that diagram, which is why it's the gross emissions. So we're just saying we're not showing any offsetting. It's just the actual. So the forestry transport emissions would be captured under the energy um, section, but it's more about the planting of trees. That's what that refers to in that diagram. So the question is, why do we use gross emissions and not net emissions? So the, so the net would have, would have taken the carbon offsetting from the planting. So it's a more so the gross emissions is a more accurate picture of the actual emissions that we're producing. If we had taken off the um, carbon sequestration, we'd have to um, sort of reduce. It would show less emissions at an absolute level. And the forestry is unpredictable given the harvesting um, regime and stuff. So it's a, a more accurate snapshot of the actual emissions we're producing, setting aside anything that we would reduce through the planting. So if we're looking at just kind of focused on, if we're trying to identify where we have opportunities for emissions reduction, that gives you a more accurate picture. Um, I think, you know, the carbon offsetting thing can be a bit of a red herring sometimes, and it looks like we're doing better than we are. Well, you, you know, I'd, I'd really like to see how well we are doing in each industry if we are offsetting rather well, than the gross. Well, there is more detail in the carbon footprint report. I guess this is just for the action plan itself. It's trying to illustrate this is the snapshot that we have of emissions in the region, in terms of absolute emissions. I'm sure through your committee you will get all of that information, Councillor Winters, I'm going to move to Councillor Clark. Hoping not convinced, Madam Chair, but I will watch this space. <laughs> thank you. Councillor Clark, then Councillor Rose. Uh, thank you, team, for probably a very aspirational document, albeit probably 30 years too late. Um, but my view really has been tempered by the events of two and a half weeks ago on the Puller River, which was the biggest single ever water event in New Zealand. Now, um, I would like some context around what the potential implication of that would be for us. Should we be able to overlay that over the Bar Plenty context and see what the impact would be? Mindful that the Buller River peaked at 7,400 cubic metres a second and the Fukatani River's record flood level two years, three years ago were 1,100 cubic metres, and Edgecombe breached at 700 cubic metres. Um, if we ever had an event of that quantum in any part of our Rohi, I think what would the impact be? And I'm saying that relative to the context about building stock banks and a whole lot of mitigation exercises that may long term be pointless if, in fact, we have an event like that. Um, I know it's a big ask, but I think it would be quite relevant and also give our communities a perspective of what could potentially happen because it just happened two and a half weeks ago. We were fortunate it happened in the Buller region. They wouldn't think so, but we should be grateful. Through you, Chair, um, I think that kind of uh, that aspect of that work will be covered through um, the adaptation project that's going on, looking at the risks within the region and the likely climate impacts that are coming, um, and also connects in with um, civil defence in terms of the response and the emergency. Yes, thank you. 
um, and also the um, Fakatani Tarama Resilience um, project that's happening. So that's definitely on the agenda, and of course that will involve the engineering and flood protection teams and just getting that wider understanding so that we're able to communicate that to the community as well. Councillor Rose and Council Ron Darlison. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> I'm quite surprised that there was no mention of um, the Billion Trees projects, um, no mention of carbon credits, um, no mention of any of that within the action plan itself, and actually how how that's going to um, move forward in this space. I'd also like to recognise that within this, there was no um, there was no clear aspect around the whole decision making side of things and recognising that the decisions that are being made um, through this action plan will have an effect on the next 50 to 100 years. Now, I have to agree with Councillor Clark, 30 years too late, but you can't change that. Um, I'd also like to um, talk about what um, Councillor Nee said as well. Um, I'm, I'm grateful that youth is mentioned in the document, but I think we cannot turn around and say that there is no more, uh, there's no necessary engagement needed with our communities when one of our key goals is ensuring that our community is aware of climate change and the impacts it's going to have. Um, yes, young people know it's there, but there are some people who don't and there are some people who, who need to know and it needs to be recognised. So other than that, I'd like to congratulate you guys. It is a brilliant document um, and you've done a lot of work and um, yeah, well done. You, um, through you, Chair, just to clarify the engagement section, that's um, a mandatory section in the paper that refers to the paper and the action plan. So it was saying we're not going to be engaging on the action plan. That's what that was referring to. So it's by no means about not engaging with our community. That's, as you say, a fundamental part of the work we're doing because it's going to be impacting across all our region. Um, the billion trees and cut, um, that type of project would be captured so that sits um, within the integrated catchment space so Kim works quite heavily on that so although it's not explicitly mentioned we have you know had to kind of be a bit selective about what we first did but it, is, it will be there um, and if there will be significant activities coming through in that space it would come through the reporting and monitoring and ops. Councillor Bond Dardelson and then I'm sorry we're, we're now behind our schedule. Um, okay. Whoops. Thank you for your report. Um, it, it, it's a great first start. Um, I just want to raise one issue, and, and it affects what we're doing as a regional council vis-a-vis um, -vis our territorials and uh, Tarana, um looking forward um, to future development. And, and that is a report by the NZ Rise. Uh, which was funded $7.1 million, and it's, it's based out of Victoria University. Um, they, have a, they, they were to look at sea level rise between 2018 and 22. So it's an interim report. And um, in that report, it states, overstating the risk of sea level rise can be as much of a problem as underestimating it. Now, um, I brought this up with staff, this report, because it does affect... Um, the um, you know what, what is happening uh, with regard to future development and um, staff came back with four four uh, maps that came out of the report and uh, which shows that because of the tectonic plate movement basically the whole of our coastline and our rohi is actually rising through a lift of about three millimetres a year on average uh, because of tectonic plate movement. And I think our councillors should have that information now. It was sent to me, the four maps, and instead of showing, you know, like we've written off any movement in Mount Monganui for future development because of and, and, and because of a combination of sea level rise, blah, 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 um, and um, water tables, so I'm not saying that this will change anything, but it's just knowledge base. And, and I think um, that was a very good report. It's only an interim report, but it actually 
found that there's only three areas of carona that are subsiding, and that's Soffer Point, understandable, it's a reclamation, uh, to Dia Industrial, understandable, it's a past wetland area, and um, Fraser Crow Brook Street, which is industrial and, and was again probably below sea level before it was uh, redeveloped. So those are consolidated, you know, that's logical. By the way, Rotorua, you are slipping, you are sinking right around Rotorua. So um, not that that should make any difference actually to where you are, because I don't think the sea will ever get you there. But you are, you are subsiding. You are subsiding. My, my, point, my point here is uh, this is good information. Our staff didn't have it. Um, I shouldn't have to ask for it, I don't think. I think we, we need to be kept appraised. It just shows that um, good science, um, is, th there's no finite uh, thing. We're learning as we go, and I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, I think storm effect, as Councillor Clark said, it will be a huge issue for us going in the future, and, and there's current science that says that the moon's gravitational pull will alter in the, in the next 10 years to, to cause even more sea level damage, uh, you know, storm effect damage. Um, and that's, that's got nothing to do with climate change. That's gravitational pull of the moon. It's, that's what they're predicting. So um, all I'm asking is, is that staff you know, recognise that this is not, there's no end game here. This is a, a moving feast, and I, I would like to feel that I'm being kept as fully informed as possible. Uh, when I saw those maps, um, I was quite surprised. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I wonder what tomorrow's headlines will be. <laughs> um, are there any further uh, questions or comments? If there are none, um, I want to really, really thank you and Laverne, um, you as well, uh, for this. The only point I have is the clarity of nexus between our actions and the government budgets for 25 or 30 or 35, etc. And I think um, that's an area of work that's obviously going to you know, be needed going forward, particularly in the emissions, uh, carbon emissions, transport space. So thank you. Uh, so thank you on behalf of the committee. I'm going to move receipt of the report, seconded by Councillor Mees. No further debate or discussion. I'll put all those in favour, aye against and carried. Oh, I beg your pardon. Of course, right. Um, so we'll let this, sorry, the second... Um, Recommendation yes. uh, approves the climate change action plan. You've got delegation for minor editorial changes in three. Well, uh, uh, the, the sort of comments I made are they sufficiently minor to be included? In, yeah, good. So I beg your pardon. Moving recommendations one through three, second by Councillor Nees. All those in favour, aye against, carry. Now, Amanda is alerting me to the fact that I'm running behind on her beautifully prepared run sheet. Um, we're now 20 minutes behind. Not that that should in any way um, discourage wonderful constructive debate and discussion, but Freshwater uh, Policy Programme <coughs> update, Nikki and team, welcome. Thank you for the report. Are we able to take that as read, Nikki? Nikki, Ruben, Julie, welcome. We'll take the report as read. Yes. Oh, sorry, um, Chairman Leader. Chair, I just wonder how you want to handle the risk assessment around this topic, because it's confidential. Yes, you want to we're going to um, okay. consider that in the public excluded section. Thank you. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning. Liz, um, this is a central freshwater policy program update. Just by way of reminder, this is the four-year program to implement the national policy statement for freshwater, and we're in that first year. And a further reminder that there's a lot of work streams on the go. Um, the key update, you've, you've got them in section three, table two of your report, and the key 
want to note is that we have launched the online mapping our treasured freshwater sites survey that's available for the public now. Leave that for the moment. We do have some key messaging in here for decision. Uh, that's on in section 3.1 and attachment 1. So it's pages 71 and 74. It's initiated because there was some concern that we were hearing that some small handful of farmers perhaps were purposefully keeping nutrient levels high on their farms or concerned about acting now in case that disadvantaged them later in terms of good management practice. So this is just some messaging of what we can say without disadvantaging or, or predetermining our policy options for the future. And we're looking for just some positive messaging there to be approved that our land management officers can express and that can be used in communications going forward. It's timely and, um, and that it's aligned with the release of the Freshwater Farm Plan discussion document. So Nikki, would you be good enough, could we just pause there and just focus on that messaging um, yes. so that we can obtain counsel or input into that. Is that okay? Yes. So, so that's it's attachment one. Okay. Yeah, attachment one. <coughs> just focusing on that. Uh, comments from elected members? Uh, Councillor Winters. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just on page 68, the farm plan regulation stock exclusion regulation. Um, I was just looking at those um, national guidelines and I take it excluding land above 500 metres of sea level, is that correct? Is that what it's saying for stock exclusion? Uh, yes, so that's not related to our key messaging, that's related to the national documents. Yeah. Should I come to those now or the next? Yeah, that's fine. So yeah, they are proposing to exclude all land over 500 metres from the stock exclusion mix. So the Mamakus, Kaharoa, would be excluded because they sort of sit around 600 metres above sea level. Is that what we're saying? That's what the central government is proposing and we're having some mapping done well, now of which parts of our region we wouldn't have Bring it on. Mm, Man, are we going to have some... Uh, oh, try, try bringing that one in. Stock excluded from 500 metres above? No, no, no. Oh, sorry, no, it's the opposite. Yeah, that's the opposite. It's, they're saying that any land above the 500 metres above sea level, the stock exclusion regulations would not apply to, even if their land slope is less than 10 degrees. So. At the moment, the stock exclusion regulations apply to land that is less than 10 degrees. Oh, <laughs> well, that's <laughs> that's I read that all wrong. Sorry, <laughs> Madam Chair, but I, somebody, I need a, um, maybe it's my dyslexia, but hey, I, um, I read it completely wrong. Sorry, my apologies. No, no that's fine. Councillor Love. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd just like to go to uh, risk and medication to make an overall comment, realising that it's going to be discussed later. But I really think that what you're requesting there is really a matter for the Risk and Assurance Committee. And I would, I would think that I'm quite happy to work with this committee in that process. But I'm just wondering if what the correct procedure should be is you pose those questions to my committee uh, where we will deal with them uh, as with the other risks which we face. Right. Who can answer that one? I would suggest to you that the risk that all the risks would focus on is the delivery to December 14. All the rest falls into the operational context. Mm. I still think that um, we will be discussing those matters in the risk and assurance meeting, but I understand that there, there's a, a specific aspect to that which you obviously belong to here. Thank you. So now, could we focus on the messaging? Oh, sorry, Councillor Brennan. Can I just ask, when it comes to farm management plans, are we looking at the mitigation that has already happened on many farms to take that into account, or are we starting from a new zero base? 
Uh, this is to do with the national proposal for freshwater farm plans. The discussion document is out for public feedback now and we're preparing our response at the moment and we will have an informal discussion with you as we're framing those submission points up. The proposal, uh, that's 25th of August, booked for you to have that discussion. Um, the proposal from central government has a question about that, what would be the time frame for an existing freshwater farm plan to be reviewed and brought into the process. So we, we can form a submission around saying, please don't review those until five years or three years or whenever they would normally expire. Could we focus on the messaging? Hmm. Um, so it's reference, uh, no, um, I'm just trying to get us to look at that so we can give some direction to staff. Mentioned in the report attachment one, Councillor Nees. Thank you. Well, I don't really have a problem with the messaging. I think it's really, really good and clear. Um, I think the word that leapt out to me was great grandparenting in the bottom section, which immediately makes them think, oh, sort of counts against our message, if you, if you understand, but I, I accept that that's the reality. My question is more about what communication strategy are we wrapping around these um, messages? Because I'm very conscious that Councillor Browning and I will be going to the Bay Plenty Agricultural Advisory meeting tomorrow night, and normally we would if anything like this had come up, we would be addressing that with them, particularly since some of those members have been uh, very vocal in the media recently about how it's getting pretty tough to be a farmer and, and um, <clears throat> you know, there are huge challenges. So what are we planning to wrap around these messages and will they be available for us to table tomorrow night? The initial purpose of this was to give one set of response that if a land management officer or any other staff member was asked by a farmer or in a meeting like the one you're attending, they could give a response aligned to this. Um, because the sort of question that does come up is, are you going to grandparent? And would it be an advantage to us not to act now? And we're trying to give the message it would be best to move towards good management practice now, but accept that we can't tell you what our policy position is going to be this early in the process. So it's not intended for public consumption, it's just for staff to tell people when they ask the questions. It can be released publicly if you would like that, if you decide that this is <coughs> acceptable messaging. Um, we take your direction on that if you want some public response out there now, public communication. So first off, the messaging contained in the report, is anyone opposed or wants to see changes made to that messaging which will primarily be for staff to engage with affected persons? Are we pretty comfortable that the messaging is okay. Jim, are you? I just urge you all a, quish, a, word, a word of caution, Chair, as long as staff reflect um, issues that arise day to day and they're reflected in the, in the narrative that goes out there. Just sounding a bit obtuse, sorry. Okay. Yeah, no, we've got that. So, Councillor Winters? Yeah. Um, one of the lessons uh, that I learned a long time ago is when we started <coughs> Plan Change 10 in Rotorua, and we went out with the wrong messaging to landowners, and we actually had to bring them into the tent really early. And it wasn't a, a blame game. It's, we, we cannot blame one sector of society for all our freshwater problems. And I think we've got to make sure that our narrative, as the Chair said, is bringing, encompassing all the landowners into the tent. 
You're all part of the problem, but we're all part of the solution, both rural and urban. And you know, I look at I look at Auckland, for example, when it rains, what happens in Auckland? All the wastewater ends up on the beaches. Some of our worst waterways are in our urban sectors. So we can't blame one sector for all the issues. And I think so the narrative has to be really clear that we want everybody in the tent together because we're all in this together. Thank you. Just reminding us that these messaging are primarily focused on good management practice. Yes, it is. In terms of yes. agricultural, <coughs> horticultural use. Look, I, I think, I think, yes, um, to be to be exercised wisely, judiciously, uh, carefully, and with empathy is probably uh, the messaging. And I would, I think that what we need to probably do, Jessica, sitting there from comms, is to probably think about actually other wider comms matters uh, in this regard. Um, so, look, if there's no further debate and discussion on this, that I think that's our position with regards to this. Can I just have one word? Hey, actually, I'm actually really encouraged by what's happening out there. In the context of the Eastern Bay, the intergenerational farming, the kids coming through uh, are really pro-environment. Um, in the last few years, I've seen significant changes, and most of them are readily accepting of the changes. It's also been enhanced by the fact that dairy is currently doing very, very well, and so it's a time where affordability is possible. So, um, yeah, and also compliments to the quality of our land management offices. We've got some great people out there with good relationships and it's working really well. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Nikki, have you got further material you wish to canvas? Uh, in the report, yes, um, we can also look to add one more line that I think we originally had in there, but we're trying to shorten it, but saying we recognise that a lot of people are doing good, yeah. good management yeah. practice, so we'll put that in, if that's okay. So that's all for that topic, and I'll just touch on other parts of the report that you may have questions on. Thank you. So you want, you want us to ask you any questions in relation to the balance of the report or you're going to guide us through? We really the two key things that you requested us to report back to you on was more information about the implications for Māori. So we've done quite a um, substantial attachment and Ruben is here, Anaru is away sick at the moment. So he can answer questions and the other is the public excluded item. Thank you. So are there any questions or comments with regards to the engagement with Māori? Councillor White. Yeah, just a comment. I think you're, you're, it's pretty extensive engagement. I guess it comes down to the sense of the, the quality of the engagement. Um, you can fire the, the shotgun, but it's a question of whether you're hitting, what targets are you hitting and to what degree. So, um, yeah, I'd be interested in, in the course of time, uh, how, the, how the quality um, feedback is coming through in this engagement. You've got a lot of names here, and I'm absolutely total for what you've got, but you know, ultimately it comes down to that level of support you're getting out there. Any comments? I, oh, sorry. Um, I guess feedback is relative to the positioning of each of those iwi. We are at the moment with some of the variables we're dealing with. Um, we tend to find that those, for example, those iwi with a greater understanding and experience in those policy developments, they, their feedback to us are quite narrow and specific. So, for example, the, the really big titans in the iwi landscape, you're talking the CNIs and the big ones, they're very narrow in scope as to how they'd like to be involved in what information they're looking for. Whereas you further on down the capacity spectrum you, you go, then uh, I guess the best way to describe it is that in terms of our needs for policy development, we've got an inverted triangle and that for the iwi with greater capacity needs, they need a greater scope of support and leading towards a narrow piece of information that we as council need from Tanga to Fino, particularly their Matauranga. Um, whereas the further up the spectrum of capacity and understanding you go, 
the more narrow that feedback is for us. So I guess what I'm saying is that those, those capacity challenges, we want everything in terms of information. And those that with experience and good capacity are very specific as they best Thank you. Okay, can we turn to the recommendations, please? There are three, including the re uh, recommendation for the public excluded item. Is there someone prepared to move the recommendations one through three? Thank you, Councillor Rose. Seconded. I'll second. Further debate and discussion? There is none. I'll put those, all those in favour say aye, against and carried. Thank you very much, um, team. We're now going to move to the item on water shortage uh, events and the revised um, delegation. A very self-explanatory uh, report. Uh, so I think we can take that report as read. There is no PowerPoint. Sarah and your team, do you wish to add to the report? Because I think it was very clear. Uh, if, you, if you're happy with that, that's fine. I was just going to read a couple of points, but I think it's you. Wonderful. Um, Mr Chairman, just will wait. I'll move it. Oh. Second. Shall we just... Let you make a couple of points and <laughs> no, no, you're happy? It is. Uh, if you're comfortable with, with uh, yeah, I think I'm if you're comfortable with the direction we've had over the last 80 months, that's yeah. really what we're here to be in force. Yeah, I thought it was a very, very good report. Thank you very much. So it's been moved and seconded. No further debate and discussion. All those in favour say aye, aye. against and carried. And thank you, Mr Chairman, you've called us nearly up. So <clears throat> we're now going to the recommendations from Committee Māori. Uh, Self-explanatory, we have had a full debate and discussion in relation to these. Uh, is there any need for any further information? Councillor Love. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <coughs> Acknowledging that um, when we took that decision at Committee Maori, I, I, I was aware that we'd have to come further up the chain for ratification. Uh, and I think this is a, a vital point for the community, and I've been going out around the community, and in fact I've been making a nuisance to myself in, myself in two supermarkets in particular, randomly asking people what they thought of this issue. And I fully uh, understand the position of the Maori councillors when they say they saw this as, a, as a, an inclusive item for the future, and I think for the long term that may well be. However, uh, that the overwhelming response I have got from asking the questions in a neutral way as I possibly could, but that people view this as politically and, and divisive, uh, and it, it could be counterproductive to what to the longer term aim of what we're trying to achieve, which is bringing our communities together. So in representing that overwhelming opinion which I've had, I'm going to vote against uh, this particular uh, recommendation. I do so with some reluctance, but I think it's important that the people who have that view should be represented. Thank you, Councillor Love. Further comment? Councillor Thurston. Uh, I think there's clear a conflict earlier on, but I think I'm authorised to speak, am I not? Um, I, I, I support uh, what is proposed. Um, there are national principles and guidelines around the flying of the nationals uh, insignia and uh, I'll be supporting it on the basis that we as an organisation adhere to uh, all conditions and requirements as placed by uh, uh, the government and the realm in terms of uh, how the national symbol will be flown alongside the Maori fleet. Councillor Rose. Yeah, um, thank you, Madam Chair. I will be supporting this motion as as it stands. Um, <clears throat> speaking from um, a younger perspective, I think this does show um, a much clearer um, sign of unity, um, knowing that we are going to be flying all three flags um, as well and sticking to the guidelines that the government has set around flying flags. I think this is a opportunity to recognise um, that flag um, and also an opportunity to recognise the partnership that we um, as a council have, not only with our communities, but also with Tangata Whenua as well. Councillor Clark. 
Yeah, a couple of things. Um, seeking a point of clarification, I wasn't understanding that the Committee of Māori had been elevated to a full committee. So why is it coming through Stratton Poll, not going directly to full council? That's a technical one. Um, someone could give me some steerage on that. Um, and the other thing is, yeah, I actually have got a great deal of sympathy with Councillor Love's position, particularly knowing his uh, constituency. And I'm sure that if I sat out in, um, in my... Rohi, I would probably, particularly from the ages community, get that type of response. But in terms of the context of flying flags um, and where we are looking forward, I will support the motion, but albeit acknowledging uh, Councillor Love's um, concerns about it has been valid in many cases. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, sorry, Bob Dardles, and then Councillor Crosby. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Look, I, I have huge sympathy with Councillor Love because I get the same sort of issue. I have no problem at all with flying the flag as long as um, both flags are flowing. Um, I, uh, however, when I talk to people in the community, I get the same reaction that it's, that, that it's just a sign that we're going a bit overboard. Um, I'm, I'm not going to die in the ditch on this one. Um, just recognising that um, it's it's perception rather than reality that we have to uh, it's it's how we we seem to be um, as an organisation. So th there's some there's some very good pros uh, for flying it, and and there's some very serious um, concerns as well. So that's where I stand. Thank you, Councillor Crosby, then Councillor White. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, these issues can be um, actually quite sensitive and we need to respect that. I support Councillor Thurston um, and it's not actually in the resolution that we must um, adhere to uh, the Ministry of Culture and Heritage guidelines at the moment that are flown incorrectly. Uh, the New Zealand flag must be flown from the left, actually not in the middle, as an example. Um, and uh, so I don't have an issue with the, um, the Māori flag being flown, providing it's flown in with the guidance of the national guidelines, which means the national flag must be flown with prominence all the time. So you can't have the Māori flag there in the absence of the national flag. So I'd like to see in the resolution to give staff very clear guidance uh, that um, the flag flying, and it, and it applies to other flags to another insignia, and there might be good occasion where we have to fly um, another flag, and that, uh, another nation's flag, as an example for a particular purpose, that we do follow the Ministry of Culture and Heritage flag guidelines, are there for a reason, um, they're very good, they make sense, and um, uh, we have, you know, the um, other office in Whakatane, for example, I don't know how many flag poles that's got, but if it's got one, um, then you have to fly the Māori flag beneath the national flag, as an example. If it's three, you put the national flag to the left and work your way through. And so those guidelines are absolutely critical. Um, and uh, the Māori flag has been recognised by government some time ago. And so um, I would support it, providing it's done uh, alongside the government guidelines. Madam Chair, if you're happy to accept that motion, I'll second it. As a member. All right. Yes, so the um, it, uh, A agrees to amend the Council's existing policy to fly the National Māori flag at Tuimuana Regional Council every day in accordance with the New Zealand Ministry uh, Heritage and Cultural Natural and National Principles and Guidelines. Protocols. Protocols. And protocols. Thank you. So that's been moved. Actually, was the original motion hasn't been moved. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so bearing in mind, uh, is somebody prepared to actually move the motion so that an amendment can be found? Councillor Rose is moving the motion. Is there someone prepared to second it? Councillor Brummer. So there's now been an amendment proposed, which I've just read out. Is the mover prepared to accept that amendment? Thank you, Councillor Rose. Councillor Brunning, you're prepared to accept that as a second? 
Okay, so we've now got an amended motion on the table. Further debate and discussion, Councillor Mees. Thank you. I just want to note that I'll be voting in favour. Um, that uh, partnerships with Māori is one of our key strategic tanks and priorities, and I think that this is a just um, a resolution decision for Council at this time. Councillor White. Um, yeah, kia ora um, I did explain the concept of behind the flag itself and the design and the concept of separation of Mother Earth, Father Sky, Kao Mara, the world of light of which we live in and we share in and we relate to our relationship to the, to the environment and everything around us. That's what the flag actually means. And it comes from that whole notion of Matara Māori as an old tradition. That's how we express our world. So that's the flag. The colours red, black and white to note that. In the context of where we are at the moment with partnership, and I see what Councillor Nies is saying, this particular council has, was the first council to adopt wards, the first thing, so it's seen as a leader. Secondly, it is seen as a, as a lead organisation and connections and engagement with Māori, which is a hugely topical issue right now, obviously. It has very a lot of importance in the way we move forward as a nation, and we are seen as taking the lead in that space. The Committee of Māori also has been elevated to a Committee of the Whole, so all of that is seen as hugely positive leadership role and engagement with Māori. And so the flag itself, in many ways, just symbolises the grace and the courage, if you like, and the, and, and the connection with community as a whole. That's what that, to me, what it symbolises. So I, I just would congratulate the Council, just even having this on the table, let alone moving it as a motion. I think myself, obviously, I support it. Um, and I, I appreciate the, the, the comments that Councillor Love and others have made around differences of views and opinion. Um, you know, this is a moment, and I think the flag, and you know, flying with the, our, our national flag, offers a very, very definite position of reconciliation of, 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 of parties in that space. The, t the Treaty of Tertiality has been mentioned, obviously now, and more and more in government dispatches, and it's a very bold reflection of what we are as a nation. So we heard from Mataranga Māori being heard in international sectors now in the presentations. And so, look, I'm, I'm in the absence of my other colleagues who are not here, Toi and uh, Mati Moana, I certainly am um, supportive of it. And I, and I, uh, but I do appreciate, you know, the, the tensions that are out there and the differences of views, but my support. Thank you. Councillor Winters. <clears throat> um, just so if we pass this, Madam Chair, we're going to have to see three flagpoles in, installed at the Rotary office because we haven't got any at the moment. No. Is that correct? We will see that. Cool. Further, Councillor Love. Uh, thank you for allowing <coughs> me to come back again. <coughs> um, I fully agree with most of what Councillor White has said. <coughs> but I think um, the important thing for Maori to do in this particular regard is to go out and sell the, sell the objective, sell the meaning of the flag to the population. Because we do it in a, unless you do that in advance, you, it, it's not going to be understood and it is going to be a, a red flag as far as what a significant number of population are concerned. So I suggest what you need to do before we take this step it, it is, to, is to explain to the population what the flag actually means in the very eloquent way you explained it to us at the last meeting. Hmm. If you'd like an opportunity publicly to re-emphasise the wonderful eloquent way you described it previously. I'll take any opportunity to explain that. <laughs> <my eloquent language. laughs> Right, there are no, I'm going to give the mover a right of reply if you'd like to, Councillor Rose. Do you have anything further you'd like to add as the mover? No, um, just to emphasise that um, this is a, a bold step for our council, um, recognising that um, we must follow the protocol um, and the rules that have been set by the Ministry um, of Culture and Heritage. Um, but also recognising, as has been stated by um, Councillor White, that we have led in the council space in regards to our partnerships with Māori, and this is just another step forward um, in partnership with Māori um, in all aspects. So, 
Thank you. I'm going to put the motion. Can I just make one more comment, Madam Chair, just very quick. Um, the, the coming committee Māori, as you know, the Minister will be there in attendance. And it's been a wonderful message, obviously, um, to put to her as well when she comes, and recognition of a lot of the expectations that our minister does have, but also the heart for seeing our nation come together in an appropriate way. So that's all. Thank you. I'm going to put the motion. All those in favour say aye. 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 Against? The motion is carried. Thank you. We're now going to move to the Bay of Plenty Sustainable Homes uh, initial direction report. Santiago and Chris, uh, I thought the report again was self-explanatory and can we take the report uh, as read? And you're going to do a PowerPoint presentation, Santiago? Dr. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Thank you. Um, Good afternoon, councillors. Um, while the presentation gets um, put up on the screen, the report really follows from um, your decision in adopting the um, long-term plan recently uh, for us to establish a sustainable home scheme for the for the region, and is also one of the actions in the climate change action plan that you considered um, earlier today. So as um, Outlined previously, this is essentially um, extending the successful model that we've um, applied in the Rotorua Hot Swap um, program, where uh, we offer homeowners um, grants and loans uh, for the installation of, um, in this case, solar power, um, insulation, and clean and efficient heating. Uh, and then they can repay those loans through targeted rates. So in the long-term plan, um, you made some provision for um, operational and, and development costs, um, and also um, earmarked two million in capital funding for the actual loans and grants. So what we're seeking from you today um, is agreement on the objectives for this scheme, uh, which would allow us to, um, over the next year or so, um, design and develop the scheme. And, and we plan to um, come back to um, committee workshops and, and future meetings to um, have some discussion with councillors about that um, and also um, confirm decisions. So on um, the, the diagram on page 108 of, of your um, agenda outlines the um, timeline and the process that we um, plan to follow over the next year so that uh, we can launch the scheme um, in July. Uh, 2022. Before going to the um, proposed objectives, I just wanted to provide a bit of context. Um, so you, you had um, a discussion earlier about um, our carbon footprint. Uh, so the um, pie diagram there at the bottom is the net emissions. And um, as you can see, there are 10% um, of our original emissions in 2015-16 in were due to um, stationary energy and a, a, about half of that um, is due to electricity consumption. So these are um, indirect emissions from electricity use in our region. Um, even though those emissions will be coming from um, electricity from the grid generated from non-renewable sources, so mainly we're talking about um, electricity generated from gas and coal, uh, mainly in the, in the Handley power station, which is, as you know, outside our region. Um, so over the last 10 years, um, the um, electricity from the grid um, is 80% coming from renewable sources, so mainly hydro, solar, um, geothermal, a bit of wind, um, and 20% is um, the, the red bars there coming from mainly gas and, and coal. And you can also see from that picture there that generation hasn't actually increased uh, very, very much at all um, over the last 10 years. Councillors may have also um, seen these headlines over the last month or so. So um, at a national level, there is an issue with um, the supply of gas and also due to consecutive dry years, um, the hydro lakes are a bit empty and um, demand is, is through population growth and, and um, the expected increased uptake of um, electrification for transport and industry. We're expecting demand to nearly double um, across the country by 2050. So, so we do have an issue there. So that's really the, the emissions that the scheme is trying to, to get at. Obviously, um, we're not going to resolve the problem with a $2 million um, regional scheme, but it, it, it is supporting um, that transition in line with um, our strategic priority and, and our strategic framework. 
So, um, yeah, as I said before, what we're um, seeking from you today is just agreement um, on the proposed objectives for the scheme. Um, and noting that we will come back to you with um, detailed design um, of the scheme over the next year or so um, at several points. So, that's all. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. So, Councillor Nees, then Councillor Winters, Councillor Love, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Nees. Just a question about how we're going to use those objectives, because the question for me is there are other co benefits, as you mentioned in the report, about improved air quality, improved health outcomes through warm and drier homes, etc., and, and decreasing the cost of, of power bills, etc. So what would be the disadvantage of also um, acknowledging the co-benefits of the scheme? Um, because we have the four well-beings that we're supposed to be looking after. But I, because I'm not clear about how those four objectives are going to be used to shape the scheme, I don't know whether it's relevant to, to add in the co-benefits, if you understand what I'm talking about. Um, so through the chair, we did discuss um, as a group of staff that before coming to you on this, and, and we thought it was important to um, recognise what are the primary drivers for this scheme, um, as opposed to secondary drivers or, or co-benefits. So, for example, if one of the objectives was air quality, then we would be targeting um, the scheme to areas that have an air, an air quality problem, and, and we're not sort of we're not proposing to do that. So, of course, we, we recognize the, the co-benefits, but, but we wouldn't des design the scheme um, based on those co-benefits. We would design the scheme based on these proposed um, objectives. Councillor Winters. Oh, um, number four there, target financial assistance to lower income. How, what is a lower income household? Because I don't understand why we're doing that. If somebody wants to come to us, be it a landlord or an owner, to say, oh, I want to be in here. Why, why are we targeting lower income and what is a low income? Define low income. Um, through the chair, the definition of, of low income for the purpose of this scheme would be one of those matters that we come back to you for discussion um, and decisions um, before we adopt something. Um, the reason what we're proposing uh, targeting low income households consistent with the just transition was because um, medium and high income households probably already have um, efficient heating and insulation, or they could access other sources of finance, like banks, for example, have um, preferential terms for their existing customers um, to install those, those facilities, but low income households um, don't have access to those um, sources of finance. Um, that's the reason. Thanks for that. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I view this matter as one primarily of climate change rather than social action. Um, as far as I'm concerned, we need in New Zealand to look very much at how we generate our electricity in the future. And with the exponential increase in the use of electricity with uh, cars and, and, and everything else, we need to make sure that we are not having to go back to generate from coal or other uh, such substances. So, as far as I'm concerned, um, I, I, I could make some changes, but I'm quite happy to move the report as it's stated and let the staff get on with it. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chair. Look, this is, um, this is a topic that everyone agreed to do under the LTP, so we just got to get on and do it. But I th And I think the um, recommendation here in terms of coming back to you with the format of how it will be run is probably the important one. But my position at the time I stated, my only word of caution here is be careful about the narrative that you attach to this proposal. Because in reference to PV, and you've already referenced the utilisation of coal through thermal generators. The reality is that the peak demand in terms of consumption will not be met by PV. The peak demand is essentially outside the periods of probably November to about February can only be met by hydro or thermal. So 
Just be careful of the narrative that we attach to this in terms of the justification for it, because the current stats in terms of the percentage of coal that we're using here in New Zealand is essentially to meet the peak demand. Yes. And what will happen, as we've already known, and we're fortunate to have Bay of here to have two um, solar PV farms getting established, as these go across the country, it will lead to point pricing. So outside the generation capacity of those solar PV facilities, you will find peak pricing at times of peak demand, which won't be serviced by those entities. It will be serviced from either renewable or continuation of thermal. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Happy to move. Um, Thank you. Councillor Love has moved. Councillor Lees has seconded. Further debate and discussion? No further, no. No need for a right of reply, Councillor Love. No, no. no. We'll put that. All those in favour say aye and against and carry. Thank you. We're now going to, you're going to stay right where you are, I think, San Diego. And we're now moving to 8.8, .8, update on the environmental programs grant policy. Welcome, Pim. So we have read the report. Take the report as read. Do you have a presentation for us? Um, there's no presentation, um, oh. Madam Chair. We'll just take um, the report as read and I'm happy to answer questions. Okay. So... Questions, comments, Councillor Rose. Um, one, I'm happy to move the paper, and two, um, just wanted to ask you, Pim, um, in regards to uh, the re-establishment of um, coastal wetlands and all, how many do we currently have that are established, and how many have staff got and plan to re-establish as such, if you've got the numbers on you? Through you, Madam Chair, I don't have an exact number of re-established coastal wetlands. Um, at a guess, I would say we've been involved with the restoration of probably about 60 years, somewhere between 40 and 60 so far. Um, and Braden Rouse, land management officer, who many of you will know, at, at the back of the room has done some work and looked at the potential areas that are currently in pasture that are below the spring high tide line surrounding Tauranga Moana, and that's around about a thousand hectares. So there's plenty of scope for this kind of activity. It's about finding the right mix of landowner aspirations, resources, um, hapu priorities, and trying to get as many of those benefits lining up as we can together. Councillor Lees, then Councillor Wonders. Happy to second. Oh, second. Okay, the motion's been seconded. Councillor Nays. Thank you. Um, Kim, can you tell me what's our total yearly amount budgeted for our environmental uh, program grants? What's our total budget per annum? Over the, um, well, we've split our budget now by functional activity to a certain extent. So for, for this particular initiative, we've allocated something like 350,000, both in terms of there is a proportion of capital involved with that as well. Um, I think that our total towards environmental programs for water quality is 1.8 million, something like that. And our total for biodiversity is similar. That's just physical catchments. So. Uh, yes, that, that would be um, exclusive of the sort of lakes environmental programs. I'm happy to bring a paper with those numbers accurate and um, we'll, we'll pass that around in a, in a councillor email if you'd, if you'd like me to. That, that would be helpful because, you know, I, I really support where you're going with this, particularly with regard to sweetlands and resource consents, but I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about the compensation inclusion. Um, so I think of I think of um, some of the farmland in Little Waihi, around Little Waihi and Little Waihi, uh, Kaituna, where we've got drainage schemes that are... Um, or pump schemes that are actually keeping them dry so that they can be productive and maintain production. And um, the potential compensation could be quite large. And um, I guess I, I'd, I'd like to understand, um, you know, what the quantum of compensation could be um, 
that we might have to be up um, for paying um, in some of those sort of examples, because I'm sure the farmers um, who are, are being aware that their farming occupation um, is becoming increasingly marginal might then start expecting compensation for um, retiring um, some of their productive land into wetlands. So I think we've got to be really careful. One, we could wipe out the whole budget. Um, two, we might set up um, expectations that we can't fulfil. Um, and three, we need to be um, sure that we're being equitable about how we um, fund activities like this across the region. So I, while I support this, I am quite nervous about the whole compensation and perhaps would like a bit more information and guidance around that. So through you, Madam Chair, uh, it would be staff's intention to keep, keep that one very much in the bottom drawer and infrequently used. Um, obviously, the best scenario is when a willing landowner is prepared to retire and covenant land um, through goodwill and agreement that it's the right thing to do. Um, in some cases where the benefits are significant but the um, opportunities foregone by the landowner are also significant, um, we thought it might be worthwhile having this, if you like, up our sleeves. Um, but if councillors wanted to, we could um, put in place sort of an escalated approval process whenever that particular part of the policy was invoked, if you'd prefer that. I've uh, got Chairman, Chairman and then Councillor Clark. Thank you, Chair. Similar vein to Councillor Nee's, my only concern is the uh, compensation issue here. And I think, Chair, as your committee, I think it would be a good idea if you requested a very high-level strategic paper in terms of some of the issues that Councillor Nee's raised, which is not not um, you know, small parcels of land, but what is the opportunity going forward or what is the desire, the demand going to be for major acquisitions where you don't just do wetland but you take the whole thing out because it's a much bigger strategic issue and that requires big funding. Councillor Park? Yeah, in the similar vein to what Doug was saying, it's just, um, do we actually have a formula that measures what the trade-off value is in something as simple as if a farmer made available three hectares of his lower area that could be converted, for instance, into white bear habitat over three or four years, what would that habitat produce that would enhance the wider social sphere of white bait and you know, environmental issues and stuff like that? And there could be something that could come to this table that just says, hey, you know, there'll be another you know, half a ton of white bait available in Kaituna in a couple of years' time. If we do this, this is a valued, valued use of funds. Um, and it would be nice to be able to have that sort of table, I think, and give us some direction. So through you, Madam Chair, we've, we've done this sort of thing twice before, and in each case we've brought those specific proposals to you for consideration. One was with respect to Papahika, Hawaii Island, where they lost access uh, for farming through the Kaituna rediversion. And there was a calculation based on net present value of grazing foregone over a 25 year period with some assumptions around discount rate, etc. cetera. Um, the other was the arrangement with Tumukawa, the land between the Taro East and Lake Motorway and um, the Kaituna wetland. Um, so th there are some established approaches, you know, whether you use the value of the land um, or whether you base it on the revenue or the operating profit that that land is generating. Um, as I said before, I think it, it, compensation is, as has been mentioned, it would it would quickly bubble up the budget and it would have the potential to set some quite difficult precedents for us. So, you know, hearing the discomfort about those provisions, I'm happy to either um, bring back to council any proposals that. Um, propose to use that clause or to elevate it to chief executive level or something along those lines if that makes um, councillors more comfortable. Well, we'll certainly discuss that for Councillor mm -hmm. Von Yes, yeah, so along the same lines, it is the compensation and, and, and the terminology of what is profit um, that worries me. And um, so I wouldn't be prepared to approve this holders boulders. But if you took out policy four uh, and, and look to rejig it, 
um, the rest of it I'm very happy with. So I think the general thrust is that we approved the uh, policy with, um, without policy four, and that further work, we request further work to be done on, on that, uh, and that that come back to a further meeting of this particular committee. Is that going to be okay with you? Uh, yes, of course. Would you like that work to be done uh, to cover off a policy for the whole region or on a case-by-case -case basis when proposals? Well, I think what you should do is probably put options to us. So we need to understand what a regional versus a case-by-case -case, uh, process looks like. Compensation, I think, creates legal rights uh, or obligations. Uh, we need to be very careful um, in this space. So if that's okay, we can... If there, is there any further debate or discussion required? What we're looking to do is approve the policy with, um, without policy four, and that to come back to a further meeting of this committee. So I'll um, thank you, Councillor Von Dartes, and thank you, Councillor Love. No further debate and discussion. I'll put that all those in favour say aye. Oh, it's been carried. We're on the home straight. We're now moving to item 8.9, uh, increasing support for. Um, volunteers, and I know Councillor Clark is just chomping at the bit to um, <coughs> discuss this report. Thank you uh, for the comprehensive uh, report. We'll take uh, the report as read. Uh, is there a presentation? Oh, I missed that. I was so intent. Would you repeat that, please? It's, it's age before beauty. So, no, unless Councillor Clark has a presentation, I don't. But I'd like to introduce <laughs> management officers uh, Tim Senior from Reportkey and Anna Dawson, who's based in this office. Uh, thank you both for the report. Um, much appreciated. So, Councillor Clark, do you want to have a crack? Not really. I mean, I'm actually going here to refer to the guru, which is Tim Senior. I mean, Tim has a far greater hands on reality around where this is going. There is, um, we have as yet to develop the strategy about how we grow this volunteer culture and change some of the parameters that are actually around funding. Um, but that's a discussion that needs to be had, probably workshop and put to uh, Stratton Pole. But um, I would certainly like to hear Tim's view about how he sees this been expanding because I know that there is reservations um, around, shall we say, subletting some of the conservation environmental issues as opposed to keeping it in the house. And there's uh, validation on both sides of that. It's also how we actually grow and maintain um, and support our volunteer cultures. And we need to have a big wide view on that because the whole concept of how we do it needs to have a broader vision um, to make it like more inclusive and more functional. So that over to you, Tim. Well, Tim, before before you, if you could just car park those, and in your reply also include: Is there any crossover with Bay Conservation Alliance and Enviro Hub, and or other of those groups that are providing support for volunteers? Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. It's uh, quite a few questions there. Um, so, in answer to your questions, uh, where I sit in Wapuchki, I have and have never had anything to do with bay conservation or environment. So, I can't really answer that question. Really? You answered it. <laughs> okay. Um, and in answer to your questions, Councillor Clark, um, thank you for your vote of confidence, but I would like to def defer to Anna here, who, who um, supports far more key groups than I do, though perhaps not for quite so long. Um, so I, th I think what, what, one of the really important things to bear in mind is, is, is that we as staff have really close uh, daily intimate relationships with those groups um, and they do an enormous amount of extremely valuable work um, but they always want to do more and we can't always support at the moment everything, all their aspirations um, 
So there's, there's quite a few things that we'd like to be able to do that at the moment we're, we don't really have the resources to do. Tim? And, sorry, sorry my, my, my colleague, Councillor Clare, but my concern is that we fund umbrella organisations such as those that I've mentioned to provide assistance for volunteers. And I do think, um, yeah, I'm sure we, you know, are going to agree with the chairman's uh, motion uh, to approve this, but I do think it's really important that we do further understand uh, that crossover, if there is any, uh, between our, our support here and our support for those umbrella organisations that are also providing that support. Um, but anyway, I'm sorry, I rudely interrupted you. <laughs> Thank you, Madam. As, as far as bay conservation and, and Navarra are, are concerned, it might be better if Pim and or Anna answer that one, because as I say, at my end, we don't see them at all. So I can have a go if you like, Madam Chair. Um, I think because both of those organisations are primarily Tauranga based, um, the care group's environment here has a high level of interaction with them and you know, the member organisations that we support here in the Western Bay um, have certainly mentioned the, the benefits that they get from Bay Conservation Alliance in terms of accounting and, and um, administrative support, volunteer coordination, health and safety management, policy work, um, applying for grant funding, etc, etc. And I think in terms of um, Enviro, how the real value there tends to be in the, in the, the urban environment. Um, more around sustainability, um, you know, waste use, minimisation, um, that, that kind of initiative. And there's, there's a reasonable amount of crossover as, you, as you're in the peri-urban um, sort of environment, but as we get further out into the Kaimais or into the, into the hinterland such as Kaharo, for example, then and I think bay conservation um, has its role there. Um, I, some of the groups are smaller than the groups that typically join um, bay conservation. And you know, for, for example, the, the key group plan for Johnson Reserve that I've attached to your paper, um, that Anna's been working with them, they're a, they're a small group of, of keen beans. They don't want to get involved with administration or you know grant funding or anything. And Anna gives them pretty much a full service She'll write the plan for them. She will ask them what they want, help them make sure that they tick all the right legal boxes and, and meet the requirements of any other council or archaeological authority, etc., and then provide the grant funding or the materials in a, in a really practical way. And we, we have asked them whether they would prefer for us to take a step back and have all of that care group support provided through our partner NGOs and the feedback we've had is that many of them do value that face-to-face um, -face relationship with the staff member from Council Direct, and that's why we've proposed a proportion of the funding that you've allocated through the LTP deliberations to be allocated in this way. So um, I have got questions from Council Love, Council Nees, Council Von Dardelson, but Anna, I'm conscious that you are surrounded by two forms, or uh, <laughs> do, do you want to have a say at this stage, or...? Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. I just wanted to add to Pim's comment about BCA and um, Envirohub. Over in the Tauranga region, we sit around the table once a quarter with BCA, um, Envirohub, TCC and Western Bay and all the players that do support care groups. Um, we make sure we're supporting them collaboratively in, in our own ways. Um, so there is no crossover or if we're supporting them, it is um, a joint effort. Thank you very much. So I've got Councillor Love, Councillor Lees, and then Councillor Von Dalson and Councillor Winters. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just hope it wasn't limited to Councillor Clark's assertion that as councillors we don't have a grip on reality. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor, and also my comment about the two thorns, I do humbly apologise. <laughs> 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 three three roses, three roses uh, sitting in front of us. Councillor Lees. Oh, firstly, I just want to say I really support your recommendations and your proposals. Um, um, I guess when we um, decided on 
investing in our volunteers, and it was an investment. We really wanted to move the needle. So what I'm seeking, not now, but going forward, is some sort of integrated reporting on what difference that we've made through this investment. Um, so some sort of monitoring report on a regional breakdown on how the money's been spent and the outcomes achieved. Um, because it's sort of it's under the radar that once a year we get a report and see, that tells us that so many trees have been planted and, and we support so many care groups. But if we could actually see the, the scale of the contribution that we're enabling, um, which actually does move the needle in the community, that would be awesome. And I would expect it would come to your um, committee, uh, Councillor Winters. But, you know, I'm really excited. We really want to enable our community to engage with the environment and to actually help take it forward. Um, so thank you for all your work and I look forward to seeing that report in the future. Well said, Councillor Von Bartles, I mean Councillor yes, Winters. Madam Chair, um, I 100% support uh, this motion uh, uh, and I'm happy to move it if it hasn't been. Um, can I congratulate our staff on the work they did? I, I, I will declare an interest in that I Chair the K Valley um, Centenary Grove Centennial Trust, and um, there was very little or no collaboration uh, in 2017 when I came on to chair that. And the regional council has stepped up fantastically. They couldn't be more helpful. Um, they, they've uh, uh, helped inject funds. They've helped given expertise. We now work with Bay Conservation Trust as well. Um, but uh, the role that our regional council play should not be underestimated, and it's a huge bouquet to all of your staff in this sector. So thank you. Amanda, that has to be yes, um, So I, I'm just going, the chairman has moved uh, the, reason, uh, the recommendation, Have so you seen. you're seconding okay. it. Oh, did it? Oh, okay. You kind of declare the interest, so somebody else will second okay. Councillor Clark. So, thank you, Pardon. Uh, we're now moving to Councillor Winters. Oh, um, I've got three words for him and the team. Make it easy for volunteers. That's it. You know, in terms of administration, bureaucracy, um, this was a bold move by this council to put up 500k for volunteers, extra money. Uh, we've done it. Uh, a lot of it's gone, most of it's gone to, half of it's gone to BCA and EnviroHub, but this is exactly what I wanted to see for the extra amount to small care groups um, on the ground, doing the business, make it easy, don't make it too hard for them, and uh, let's get on. And I liked the, 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 the comments from Councillor Nees. I'd like to see some monitoring. How many, how many um, pests have we killed, you know, in that time? It's a, that's a ballpark figure in terms of these care groups. Um, trees planted, wetlands created, and where in the Rohe, right across, not just in Tauranga or Rotorua. So, yeah, bit of, a, bit of a reporting back, Pim, but make it easy. Make it real easy. Councillor Clark, do you wish to have any further comment? No, but uh, uh, just a quick break. Um, three weeks ago, we did an assessment of a major project that started 12 years ago in terms of visitors, numbers, species planted, the whole thing, and uh, putting a report together that I think will be of some significance. Um, Context only for wetland, there's just over 2,000 prime species, about 4,000 other minor species, current visitors in general terms around about 30,000 people a year going working in around there. Um, and really, um, all due to, I think, a lot of the discretion of our land management officers and the regional council. There were times when they had to stretch the rules a bit to get us across the line, but we have certainly showed um, the results of that and happy to put it down on paper and present it. Yeah. So, kia ora. Thank you. The motion has been, um, I'll put the motion Aye. and, right, okay. excellent, thank you. Well done. And well done to us, regional yes. councils. Yes. Well done. Okay, I'm now going to move that the public be excluded from the uh, meeting as per the uh, recommendations contained in the agenda. I've moved the second chairman leader.
All those in favour say aye. 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 Carried. Aye.